Hello world, a very, very good afternoon. Nissan Bolivinaka from Sydney, Australia. I am Sashi Singh. And once again, welcome to Sashi Singh's Talking Point on this first Sunday in April. In episode 15 of the Sashi Singh's Talking Point program today, we will shortly be joined by Mr. Graham Davis, the award-winning journalist and communication specialist who publishes Grubsheet the widely read internet site and Facebook page on Fijian politics. Graham, a Fiji-born dual Fijian-Australian national, was the principal communications advisor to the Mbani Marama government from 2012 to 2018 as a consultant for Corvus, the Washington-based communication company. He has since become a strong critic of the Mbani Marama government. In our no-holds-barred one-to-one interview with Graham Davis this afternoon, we will discuss his image-making role during those years and why he is now advocating for the defeat of the Fiji First Party and government. As we begin, may I please request that, uh, if you can, share the SSTP page on your own timelines so that we may share the interview with Graham Davis with as many interested people as possible. To ensure that you receive notifications for all future programs, please like the SSTP page and follow us too if you can. Since we started the SST program with our first episode on Sunday, 21st November 2021, each week we have had the pleasure of new viewers. Therefore, if you are joining us for the very first time, a big welcome to you and a hearty welcome to those rejoining us. Sit back for the next two hours in a bit, relax, and be enlightened by this afternoon's program. I apologize for any inconvenience caused to our viewers today. In New South Wales, Australia, our daylight saving time has changed, and we have gone back an hour. While we are starting the program at 12 noon Sydney time today, please note that next week, we will start the program at 11 a.m. Sydney time. Yes, 11 a.m. Sydney time next week. That will be 1 p.m. in Fiji and in New Zealand and 6 p.m. on Saturday afternoon in Los Angeles and San Francisco. So, welcome once again to the Thinking People's Program. Sashi Singh's Talking Point, live on Facebook. As always, we begin today's program, episode 15, of SSTP with a warm welcome to our regular contributor, former Fiji TV journalist Nikhil Singh, to tell us of the key happenings of the political week in Fiji and in Australia. Nikhil, welcome to SSTP and a very good afternoon to you again. Good, uh, good afternoon, Sashi. Certainly a, a sunny Sunday in Sydney, I gotta say. Indeed, it is. Now, uh, starting from Fiji, the People's Alliance and the National Federation Party. Both held a special assembly this week. Both political parties prominently featured in each other's event. Are we seeing a repeat of the 1999 partnership, a post-election coalition in the making? Yes, actually, this was the City Veni Rambuka-led party's first uh, special assem- assembly since the party's formation last year. Uh, the event was held at the famous uh, Buniwono Hall in Nasori with several hundred people in attendance. Um, sharing the spotlight at the meeting, as you've pointed out, was also the National Federation Party um, officials, including the leader, Biman Prasad. So, Sashi, it is all but confirmed that the two parties will be looking to govern in partnership, should, should they be successful in the upcoming elections. According to the Fiji Times, Mr. Rumbuka said the two parties had been having discussions for months about working together. He said, um, and I quote, we will be seeing more and more together as we traverse the islands and roads of our land to spread a message of peace, stability, prosperity, and respect for human rights. 
and fundamental freedoms and the respect for the rule of law. Um, on People's Alliance side, he said, um, we are satisfied, we are compatible, and that we hold similar views and dreams. So actually, under the current election rules, uh, they cannot contest contest as a, as a coalition, um, but they can certainly make some post-election arrangements. So yes, the NFP and City Mani Rambuka are teaming up once again. Uh, now, you mentioned the annual convention of the National Federation Party. This was held in Masinu, um, and... Uh, uh, the People's Alliance Party leader, uh, Sidi Mani Rumbuka, was one of their speakers uh, at the convention. Um, and this is what he had to say as reported by Fiji Village. Um, the National Federation Party and the People's Alliance have shown that they will be working together at the upcoming elections to rescue Fiji from the crisis we're in. Now, Sashi, I do want to point out that the NFP in 2020 very strongly stated that they have never supported a coup or a coup-led government. But what we are seeing here for the second time is NFP teaming up with the very person who is responsible for starting the coup culture in Fiji. Um, Sashi, you ask, you've asked me if this is a repeat of 1999. Uh, the short answer is yes, the partnership uh, is uh, back on, uh, but I am sure neither the NFP nor Rambuka will be wanting a repeat of the 1999 elections outcome. Well, that goes without uh, saying indeed, and uh, it's a matter of uh, watch this pace as we see both parties progress uh, as the election comes forward. Now, Fiji's healthcare system has come under the spotlight in terms of the Amnesty International's 2021 and 2022 State of the World's Human Rights Report. What's the diagnosis on Fiji? Inadequacy, in one word, if you ask me, Sashi. Um, only a few episodes ago, we had the former Fiji First Government um, Health Minister, Dr. Neil Sharma, on this program, um, and he raised a number of concerns about the state of our healthcare system and how it is failing the people of Fiji. He was right on the money. Um, the report by Amnesty International is quite damning, um, as reported in the Fiji Times. Amnesty International says that uh, more than 730 people, including health workers, uh, died from COVID-19. Um, these deaths were mainly attributed to the inadequately resourced healthcare system. Hospitals turned away thousands of other patients due to bed uh, shortage, shortages. Now, in response, the health uh, ministry's Dr. James Fong said uh, in a statement that in terms of COVID-19 deaths, no patient was turned away from hospital care and the epidemic in Fiji required a scale up of operations that no one, uh, no other country in the world, including Fiji, was resourced to deal with. Now, Nick Hill, an opposition member of parliament has unleashed on the attorney general. I understand a 2014 television rights issue prompted the exchange in which the member of parliament accused the attorney general of lying. So what happened here? Uh, Sashi, this issue does date back to 2014. Uh, Fiji Television had the rights under an agreement with the International Rugby Board or the IRB uh, to broadcast what is now called the World 7 Series. No doubt there was a lot of drama unfolding about this matter at the time. Now, one person who was directly involved in this matter was Tanya Wanganika, Fiji TV's uh, former head of legal and later head of content and production. Uh, she was allegedly sacked over this uh, TV rights matter. Wanganika is now an opposition member of parliament and she told parliament during a response to the revised budget that the Fiji television board members were ordered by the Attorney General Aya Sayat Kaim to agree to share their television rights um, uh, with the government-owned Fiji Broadcasting Corporation. I should also add that the uh, FBC CEO is Ria Sayed Kayun, um, the Attorney General's brother. As reported in the Fiji Times, um, Wang Enika said it was shocking that in a public listed company, a minister could interfere at that level. She accused Kayum of being a liar, saying that if he wanted to speak about integrity, make sure, a quote, make sure your house um, is clean, your own house is clean. Now, Sashi, the question is, did Kayum really lie? 
Well, he did not deny the accusations made by Wanganika. Instead, his response was that uh, Tanya Wanganika needed counselling sessions because, uh, quote, she cannot let go of what happened, I think, 10 years ago. So that was the response from the Attorney General, Sashi. Yes, all spoken under parliamentary privilege, of course. And talking of which, the Fiji Bus Operators Association has accused the Minister for Economy for using the cover of parliamentary privilege to attack the organisation with false claims. What is the story here, Nikhil? Well, the Fiji Bus Operators Association, uh, usually known to be friends uh, with the government of the day, they're quite furious, uh, and in their statement, there is an implied threat that should the Attorney General make the same comments outside of Parliament um, and not by hiding under parliamentary pri privilege, he will face legal proceedings. The matter stems from the association's calls for a fee increase approval. Uh, as reported in the Fiji Village, the association's spokesperson, Priscilla Serevi, um, said during the debate on the revised national budget last Friday, the Minister used his parliamentary, parliamentary privilege to attack buzz operators simply because they raise their voices about the reality of the matter regarding an industry that is in economic distress. Um, she said Sayed Kayum's comments detract from the real issue, which is that bus operators simply cannot continue to function in a safe and efficient manner because economic realities always trump political expediency. Um, Serevi said it is unbecoming of a minister in his position to launch such an attack when the targets will not be able to legally defend themselves. Uh, she goes on to say that it is said that the Minister of Economy chose his parliamentary platform to respond to operators after more than a decade of them trying to get the attention of the powers that be focused on the state of the industry session. Okay, and closer to home, uh, on Tuesday, the Morrison government delivered their final federal budget under the current term of parliament. The country will be heading to elections soon, while Treasurer Josh Frydenberg delivered a budget that uh, they would hope would resonate with the voters and get the coalition back in office. Scott Morrison was being torn to shreds in the upper house, not by the opposition, but by one of his own colleagues. What happened here, Nikhil? Well, Canberra was a buzz on Tuesday last week, Sashi, as employer groups, workers, representatives, industry leaders, to name a few, converged on Capitol Hill to listen to Treasurer uh, Joseph Frydenberg deliver the Morrison's, um, uh, Morrison government's federal budget. Uh, as yet pointed out, this was the last budget for the Morrison government as the three-year parliament term rose to a close and the country heads to elections in a, in a few weeks. Surprisingly, not all the attention was given to the all-important uh, budget announcement. Uh, the Liberal government was delivering the nation's revenue and expenditure plan for 2022-2023 but um, uh, moments later, just a little later, um, Liberal Senator Conchetta Ferenvedi Wills in the upper house delivered an extraordinary attack on her colleague and Prime Minister Scott Morrison. She called him, and I quote, an autocrat and a bully who has no moral compass. She said Morrison was not fit to be Prime Minister. So she, this is not the first time uh, one of Morrison's own has uh, attacked him in recent months, we have had former New South Wales Premier uh, Gladys Berejiklian calling um, Morrison, quote, horrible, horrible person. An unnamed minister, uh, a Liberal minister, is alleged to have called him a fraud and a complete psycho. Um, former Liberal Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull said, and I quote, Scott has always, Scott, have, Scott always had a reputation for telling lies. Um, Deputy Prime Minister Barney Rejoice called him a hypocrite and a liar. This was revealed in a text message which was leaked. Um, and today, the Sydney Morning Herald reports that two, ma two men involved in a hard-fought liberal pre-selection battle have signed written testimony that uh, Morrison warned people about uh, the Lebanese background of his opponent in a crucial battle to decide a safe federal seat, helping him win a bitter contest to enter parliament more than a decade before he became prime minister. The two statutory declarations signed in 2016 about the events in 2007 claim Mr. Morrison told party members it was risky to back his main opponent, Michael Torkey, 
in the seat of Cook in the wake of the 2005 Cronulla riots because of his ethnic background and because of rumors he was a Muslim. Uh, so, Sashi, it is not uh, all smooth sailing for the Prime Minister. Well, definitely not. And uh, with elections uh, sometime soon, there'll be a lot of name calling, a lot of, uh, I guess, background checks and uh, what have you. So, any idea when are we going to the ballot box? So, the latest possible election date is the 21st of May. Uh, the Prime Minister must give at least 33 days between calling the election and uh, the polling date itself. So uh, Mr Morrison cannot wait longer than the 18th of April to visit the Governor-General and call the election. He has told some journalists um, mid-May and given the election has to be held on a Saturday, uh, this means that the 14th of May is the most likely date when uh, we will head to the ballot box, Sashi. All right, Nikhil. Well, 14th of May, that rings a bell for a lot of uh, Fijians as well. Thank you very much for your contribution this afternoon. As always, nicely presented. We look forward to seeing you next week. Have a safe and uh, blessed week, Nikhil. Thank you, Sashi. I look forward to the next segment. Thank you very much. You are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point on Facebook Live. We ask the questions that Fijians all over the world want answers to. Fijians want to know. Please like and follow the SSTP page if you have not done so. I have an important announcement to share with our viewers. Sashi Singh's Talking Point, SSTP, recognizes that questioning, constructive arguments and opinions are part of conversation. But posts with aggressive personal attacks, profanity, name-calling, swearing, defamatory in nature and or threatening will be removed immediately and offenders will be blocked from being a part of the SSTP program. Let's ob observe these rules and let's enjoy the program and let's give uh, uh, respect and time to our chief guests who appear on this program. Having said that, now it's time to meet our chief guest for episode 15 on SSTP. As you've heard on our video trailer and seen on our poster trailers, our chief guest is an award-winning journalist. Rather than me reading out his bio data, let us meet him and find out a lot more about his background, his work in the media, his work as a journalist, and his work for Corvus in Fiji, explore the reasons why he left Fiji, whether he was pushed out or whether he resigned, and why he has become a critic of the current government, the Fiji First Government in Fiji. And our chief guest is Mr. Graham Davis of uh, Grubsheet fame. Graham, a very good afternoon. Welcome to episode 15 of Sashi Singh's Talking Point. How are you this Sunday afternoon? Oh, Bulavanaka, Sashi. Um, and it's probably no coincidence that this uh, statement that you just read out about people refraining from threatening um, or savage comments uh, should be uh, read out in, in advance of my own appearance. Um, I've done hundreds of these uh, kind of encounters from where you're sitting as an interviewer. Uh, but I must say, this is a very rare experience for me, but I'm delighted to be here so far away. Ask me anything you want. Wonderful. Now, as always, as I begin, I go to the beginnings. Uh, and uh, in terms of that, uh, perhaps if I may start, what's one of your earliest memories, Graham? Oh my gosh. Um, look, I think I think the best thing to do um, is to start right at the very start. And it begins with my parents, who were two Australians who are very committed Christians, who in their mid-20s volunteered to be missionaries in Fiji. And they, they flew to Suva from Rose Bay in Sydney on a flying boat in 1952 via Numea, arrived in Suva. And almost immediately, they were sent um, by boat to Tumbo village in Lakemba, which is where they started their missionary work in Fiji, which was to last for two decades. And in the, in the case of my father, an extra period in the late 80s and, and 1990s. Um, and they began their work there. Obviously, they were the only Europeans within hundreds of miles of ocean, I assume. I think the nearest Europeans were in Vanu and Balavu. Um, in, in 1953, my mother went back to Suva uh, on the copra boat um, 
to give birth to me at Nurse Morrison's, um, which was the maternity annex of what, what is now the CWM hospital. Um, so I came into the world, um, you know, towards the end of 1953, which was just before the Queen's first visit to Fiji and pretty much around also at the same time as the earthquake, which led to the tsunami, which had fish swimming in in um, in uh, Albert Park. So um, that's how I came into the world. And of course, she then took me back to Tumbo village in Lakemba, where the mission house was on the hill overlooking um, this this wonderful place. Um, and 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 so began my my experience as a, a as a Fijian. Um, it was a very isolated place in those days. Uh, Lakemba had no airport. Um, the, as I understand it, the boat came every five weeks with the supplies that we needed in the mail, and occasionally, a, you know, a British colonial officer. But my parents were there, and of course, you know, they were on their own. Um, we had, you know, shortwave radio for for information and entertainment. Um, but of course, all of their friends were were Itauke. I mean, they, my father and mother immersed themselves in in the Itauke culture and learnt Fijian. And of course, my father travelled all over the Lao group in in you know open putt putts and things like that, uh, spreading <laughs> spreading the gospel. I, I I suppose. But also the main thing, and of course, this was the thing about the Methodist Church in Fiji in those years. It was run from New South Wales, but there was always a determination on the part of the church for Fiji for the Fijian church to eventually become independent, which it did in 1964 in advance of the independence for the country itself. So we were, you know, we were very much brought up close to the Vanua. I mean, you know, all of my friends uh, as I grew up in first in Lakemba and then in Savu Savu, you know, were, were, were pretty much in the early years all Itauke. And of course, I spoke Itauke before I spoke English, really. Um, people used to say, you know, when they heard me outside playing with other children that, that um, they couldn't tell the difference between me and the locals. My greatest regret in life is that, of course, after I left Fiji, uh, sent to school in, in Australia in, in my you know high school years, that I lost the ability to speak fluent Itauke. I mean, I still have a, a, a knowledge of the language, and of course, I can understand what people are saying, but, but in terms of fluency, I've lost that. Um, but that was the atmosphere, that, 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 or that was the background that, that, that we had at the time. And Lakemba was a very traditional place, as you can imagine. I mean, it was the seat of the Tui Nayao. And yeah. the Tui Nayao at the time was Ratu Tebita Ului Lakemba the third, yeah. And of course he was he was treated, you know, really like a sort of you know in a godlike manner. I mean, if you if 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 he came into the view, everybody had to sit down, and and of course you couldn't stand up until he disappeared from from view. And there's lots of you know astonishing stories about him as a character. I mean, he had the only car in Lakemba, but of course there were no roads, so. He'd drive this 1940s hillman round and round the rah rah, and of course <laughs> every time he appeared, people had to sit down. So that was the kind of atmosphere at the time. And of course, I grew up in the church, you know, which was the dominant thing in my parents' lives, and of course my own. So I suppose, to, in answer to your question of, of my earliest memories, it would have been, you know, my, my mother and father, obviously, but also had, we had this wonderful girl, Sapella who was my carer, really, in my early years. Uh, mm -hmm. I can, you know, I, I suppose my earliest memory would be the smell, <laughs> the smell of her, you know, the yes. wonderful coconut oil. Yes. A sm smell. <clears throat> Sorry, it's, it brings back. Brings back a lot of memories. I can see that. Uh, a lot of emotions are attached with that as well, with that particular memory. Now, uh, yeah. your 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 father then rose to the pinnacle of the Methodist Church. Uh, he became the president of the Methodist Church in Fiji. That's correct, isn't it? Well, eventually, yes. I mean, it took mm. <laughs> that was many years later. I mean, that was some twenty years later. After Lakemba, we moved to Savu Savu, which of course was a much more developed place. And but we were still, you know, we lived on the in the mission house in Savu Savu. I mean, one of the things that was fantastic about being a Luveni Talatala at the time, especially in the Methodist mm. Church, is the Methodist Church had had claimed all of the best houses, housing positions, you know. So missionaries were poor as, ch as church mice, but they lived in the best position with the best views. Um, 
So, you know, I, I remember very distinctly those years much more than I do Lakemba, obviously, because I was older. But it was also in Savu Savu that I first went to school. You know, firstly, I did correspondence um, school, um, you know, an official envelope sent from Suva with, with our lessons in. And, and then later I attended Bootha District School up on the hill overlooking the airport. Um, and, 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 you know, so that was an uh, extraordinary experience. I mean, we didn't have electricity in those days, which I suppose isn't different, too much different from parts of Suva even now. Um, so, we, you know, we had, I mean, another of my memories is that, you know, the, the filling of the lamps every night, you know, the pumping and the hissing of the, of, of, of the, of the lanterns, you know, the kerosene lanterns. Kerosene. We in the suburb, suburb, we got our first refrigerator, which was a kerosene fridge. So my mother would make, um, um, you know, homemade ice cream and what have you. And of course, in in Savu Savu in the mid fifties, one of my strongest memories is when Tip Top ice cream finally came to town. You know, so that one day in in I guess it would have been fifty eight, something like that. Um, we all traipsed down to Burns Philp, and you know, everybody had ice cream, and I. I remember the astonishing spectacle of these of these big old K men having their first taste of ice cream, and um, of course eating it in one gulp and and getting brain freeze <laughs> to the hilarity of everybody. You know, so it really was an astonishing time. Um, once again, you know, the communication with the outside world was was a, a, a de Havilland drover of Fiji Airways that would arrive at the airport, which which even today looks exactly as it did during my childhood, yeah, which is an amazing thing. Some things change, uh, some things don't. Um, and of course, you know, again, you know, the inter-island traders and everything. My parents used to go to, Fiji, to Suva in October every single year for the Methodist Synod. So I was born in October and my two brothers were all born in October, them two days apart, because that was the only time that my mother could really go and get the kind of care that was available at the CWM in those days. Um, so ours was an extremely well-planned family. Um, and, and sort of after, after that, we moved to La Toca, which was, of course, it was the big smoke because this was the only mm -hmm. place that had electricity or the first, my first experience of being able to go to a wall and turn on a light was in La Toca when we moved there in, in 1960. And I distinctly remember driving to La Toca um, on what was then a very, very bad gravel road all the way from Suva all around to the west in this 1940s Hillman that my father had, you know, it was a 1948 Hillman. And, uh, you know, it was such a difficult and long journey in those days that I, that I distinctly remember leaving Suva in the dark and getting to La Torca in the dark. Mm -hmm. And in between that, um, tackling the Sarua Hills in this Hillman, which didn't have enough guts to get over the top of the Sarua Hills. Um, and my father would have to sort of you know, let the, let the the car roll back down the hill again, and then and then sort of you know put push the accelerator as hard as he possibly could, and go up the hill and finally get over the top. So, right. I mean, that kind of experience coupled with you know multiple journeys on open seas in putt putts, you know, with no uh, none of the modern aids, and also sort of certainly, I don't ever recall having having a life jacket on any of these journeys. Um, it was a kind of different era um, in in pretty much every way. Wonderful. Now, growing up in that era in Fiji, what can you say about the society that we lived in in those days? The the community life we had. Well, look, it very much depended on which part of the community you were in. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't think there's any doubt that Fiji was very divided in those days um, between a European elite who lived a very European and, and relatively affluent lifestyle, the Itake who lived in a very traditional sense with deference to the chiefs um, and in the Vanua, and then, you know, the Indians, as they were called in those days, also living pretty separate lives. I mean, you know, I've, I've got plenty of critical things to say about the Fijian government, as you know, the Fiji first government. But one of the most brilliant things that they ever did was to amalgamate um, the education system, you know, to end the racial division in education. 
because this, you know, that at, at that time, you know, with, I mean, I went to the La Toca European School, uh, which was mm -hmm. the La Toca European School until about 1963, when it dawned on people that this wasn't really very po politically correct. So the only people that went to my school in La Toca were Europeans and part Europeans, as they were called then, you know, the Kailoma. Mm -hmm. And in fact, funnily enough, you know, Frank Bainimarama was in La Toca at the same time. I mean, my father was a friend of his because he was the jailer at Natambua uh, prison. And, and Frank Bainimarama, who's my age, was going to the La Toca Fijian school, which was the back of our place. But because I went to the La Toca, uh, sorry, he went to the La Toca Fijian school, and but because I went to the La Toca European school, we never met until sort of mm -hmm. later in life. And this, I think, has had a terrible impact on Fiji's development, and I'm very, very pleased that those days are over. I mean, we were not part of the, of the European elite, yeah? I mean, my parents weren't, you know, what, what what people would call convivial in the sense that they used to drink and and mix with Europeans. I mean, most of my, I mean, my father had, my parents had European friends, of course. I mean, so, some of whom, you know, would be known to a lot of your audience, Doug and Barbara Brown, uh, who, you, who was the principal of Navuso Agricultural College, who became um, agriculture minister in, uh, in the Mara government. Um, you know, so he while they but while they had European friends, most of my father's friends were Itake. And of course they they included the prince, you know, the princes of the Fiji Methodist Church, you know, people like Setereki, Tu Tui Livoni, um, Pola Nukula, um, Joeli Kalo, you know, uh, these were my father's closest friends. Um, and then of course, because he was in the Fijian division of the church. It was his responsibility to to work in the Fijian division, but the, but the but but there were also close ties with the, those in the Indian division of the church. So, I remember my father or my parents having people, you know, like Daniel Mustafa, Andrew Dioki, Edward Caleb, as as close friends. So, I mean, I was very lucky like that. I mean, my parents always instilled in me the importance of Fiji as a multiracial place, and that's never left me. Yeah, Graham. Uh, some people associate you as being a foreigner. Now that is far from the truth. You're born and bred uh, Kaiviti, so to say. Yes. Look, uh, you know, I do get irritated by this. You know, the the Fiji Sun has this habit of calling me the Australian blogger, which mm. I, which I find interesting because you know the person who usually calls me the Australian blogger is is uh, is somebody who is writing from New Zealand. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's an interesting thing. I mean, I, I guess one of the things is that if you leave Fiji early, which is what I did relatively speaking in, in the sense that, um, at the end of my primary education at Drasser Avenue school in Latoka, my parents decided that I, they needed to prepare me for life, you know, after Fiji, because they didn't intend to stay forever because the whole idea of being there was to sort of train up, uh, other members of the church. So that sort of, you know, they took over. Um, and they decided to send me to boarding school in Australia. And of course, that was a very, very uh, big change in my life. You know, I hadn't worn proper shoes. You know, we wore policeman sandals or flip flops everywhere or bare feet. And, you know, at, like, at Drasser Avenue School, you know, I wore sort of khaki shirts and a white shirt. And then in, a, in the space of a couple of months at the end of 1965 and the beginning of 66, I was in a suit and a straw boater, you know, with yes. in a tie, you know. Um, in uh, in a in a boarding school in in Sydney, which which you know I found very very difficult to make that transition, but of course I kept in touch with Fiji, and this is the wonderful thing. My parents really um, made sure that I was in touch with Fiji. I mean, my mother used to cut um, you know clippings out of the Fiji Times and post them to me, so I knew all about what was going on in the country, and. I was able to go back once a year. So that's the only, after the age of 12, I only saw my parents once a year. Um, and I would get a three minute um, phone call for my birthday. Um, but, I, but look, I never lost my interest in Fiji. And even when my journalistic career began, I did a huge amount of work um, in Fiji from, the, from, you know, before the 87 coup, um, when the Bavandra government came to power. Uh, you know, I went there for Channel 9 and interviewed, you know, people like Krishna Dutt, who I'm still in touch with. Um, it was a great tragedy what happened there. 
uh, you know, with the defeat of that government. Um, I, I went to Fiji on the day of the 87 coup. Um, I got a phone call to say that it had happened. I was called into Channel 9. I went on the Ray Martin show and told them what I could about what had happened. Um, and then later in the day, I was on a plane to Fiji. Because I'd been a Fiji citizen since independence, you know, I, I just slipped into the country and stayed with a friend of mine in Suva. Um, but of course, that didn't stop me from getting arrested when, when I got picked up at a roadblock when I was stupid enough to get into a car with other Channel 9 people. Um, anyway, he came down and got me out of the Tratonga police station. Um, but they were very interested in the fact that I was that I had a Fiji passport. You know, wait, where did you get this from me? And um, <laughs> and I'd been on a holiday. <laughs> I'd been on a holiday in Egypt, so I had all these Arab stamps in the passport, and and they were saying, you know, oi, so uh, you've been in Libya, eh? Because as you remember at the time, there was a huge scare about the Libyan presence in the Pacific. Anyway, this friend of mine who who, who I, I'll spare him any association, public association with me, but he came down and got me out. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, that was the start of my, I suppose, my media thing. And, of course, I did lots of other stories, uh, not only for Channel 9, but for Sky News in Fiji. And I, I've also written for The Australian about Fiji and various other publications. And, of course, I started my blog, Grubsheet Fiji. Um, I think it was sort of 2010, 2011, and of course, I started to write these articles because, they, and because they were pro Barney Marama, they, they, they appealed to the Fiji Sun. And of course, everybody will remember that, you know, the shocking Davis propaganda was also sort of republished in, in, in the Fiji Sun. So, you, you know, I, I suppose, it, you know, to use the old cliche, you know, you can take the boy out of Fiji, but you can't take Fiji out of the boy, probably applies to me as it does to so many other people. Certainly does. Uh... Now, let me assure our viewers that uh, I will be asking Graham a lot of questions today about his association with the Fiji First Party, his association with Corvus, and uh, a number of uh, interesting um, issues as well. Now, Graham, I'm one person who loves to meet and chat with journalists. I could spend hours uh, talking to you about journalism, your background. However, there are a number of viewers this afternoon who are impatiently waiting to hear about your work in Fiji, especially for Corvus and the Fiji government. So let us begin our real discussions today. Um, let us begin with something very current and start off by addressing the partnership that has been announced between the People's Alliance and the National Federation Party for a post-election coalition. Both parties participated this week in each other's conventions in the last few days. What are your thoughts on this partnership? Look, I think it's a game changer. I think it's going to completely alter the political landscape in Fiji. I'm very excited about it because for the first time, we've actually got a, a, a winning combination here that replicates the multiracial face of Fiji first. And, you know, while I and a lot of other people have had reservations about City of Eni Rambuka over the years since 1987, and I've been very critical with him in the old days, um, you know, I accept that he's changed. I mean, I think he changed in the 1990s, and I show, I think he showed evidence of that in the 1990s, um, you know, despite the National Bank scandal and, and various other things associated with this. You, you know, the thing about um, Rambuka, uh, in stark contrast to Bani Marama and Kayum, is that he respected the institutions of state, yeah, that, that he didn't interfere with those things. And he forged this astonishing partnership in the 1990s with J. Ram Reddy, the then head of the NFP, um, you know, which produced the 1997 constitution. And whatever you might say about that constitution, and of course the Fiji First Government you know, doesn't, you know, doesn't like it at all or didn't like it at all, um, it was a partnership between the majority indigenous Itake party and the traditional, um, you know, Indian party, if you want to call it that, or Indo-Fijian party, that was extremely good for the country. Yeah? And the tragedy is that the people were manipulated into repudiating that partnership. Um, as, you, as you know, you know, um, Rambuka was defeated and, and, and so was J. Ram Reddy, specifically because they'd forged this agreement and, and, and people on both sides thought, you know, accused them of treachery. 
But it's very interesting if you think about the consequences of what might have happened in Fiji had that partnership worked and had that ha, had that been accepted. Because I'm I personally think that we would not have had the rebellion of 2000, you know, the George Spate rebellion of 2000. And be, if we'd been able to avoid the George Spate rebellion of 2000, obviously, axiomatically, we would have probably avoided 2006 because it was those events that set off pretty much, you know, the train of events that that, that exist to this day. And it's a great uh, shame that Mahendra Chowdhury defeated those two um, because, of course, Mahendra Chowdhury, when he came to government, and this is why, uh, you know, I'm people think people say well you know you're very anti chowdhury it's nothing personal in fact i felt terribly sorry for the guy and i remember interviewing him you know after what had happened um in 2000 and the way he was treated up up at the you know the old parliamentary complex and and being threatened and beaten by these these hoodlums you know i i can't help feeling still that sort of like he he played a part in allowing all of that to develop by by preying on people's fears of a partnership between um, Rambuka and uh, J. Ram Reddy. And, um, and, you know, his time in government, you know, including with his son, Rajen, you know, was marked by the perception of arrogance, which I think contributed to the Spate Rebellion. So history could have been very different, I think, if that had worked. And, of course, now we have a situation in which, um, you know, uh, Rambuka is doing a deal with 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 Beam and Prasad that almost that in many ways, as as Nikhil was saying earlier on, you know, um, has echoes of 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 the of the arrangement in the 1990s. I think things have changed so much in Fiji, and people are, are looking for something for other answers, and they're looking for you know cooperation in government and sort of people working together in a way that we haven't seen with Fiji First for a very long time. But I think, you know, the impediments to this thing working um, are just not there in the same way that, as they were in the 90s. So I'm very hopeful of this. And, and let's just look at it in detail. Um, I, I think it's important for these reasons, yeah, for the following reasons. Um, it, 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 it gives us a choice, a viable choice. Uh, to Fiji first, which replicates the multiracial, multi-religious agenda, which I think everybody has come to accept that we need in Fiji. I don't think there's any real, I, I don't discern any real debate that Fiji should be for the Fijians or, you know, all of that kind of racist nonsense that we've had over the years. I think there's an appreciation now of the need for everybody to work together. Um, and this is this is a really good uh, you know, deal, an arrangement. What does it give Rambuka? It not only gives him a multiracial face, but it, it gives him access um, to the best of the people who are in the National Federation Party. Um, you know, for all the, the criticism that Beeman Prasad gets for not being terribly charismatic, I think he's a person of tremendous integrity. And he also knows a lot about the economy and, the, and economic matters. And I think... Um, you know, he, he brings to Rambuka economic credibility that he badly needs. Um, P.O. Tikondua Ndua, the, the NFP president, is the former permanent secretary in the prime minister's office. Tikondua Ndua knows how government, the, you know, the Fijian government works. So he brings a tremendous amount to this partnership. Lenora uh, Gerangera Tambua is easily the best speaker in Fiji, or, you know, many people would acknowledge that she's a tremendous uh, asset to that party. Um, and of course, now we have the prospect of Richard Naidu also being in the mix, you know, the Suva lawyer who hasn't yet confirmed his intention to stand, but he is going to stand. There's no doubt about that. And my understanding is that the agreement between uh, Rambuka and Prasad will be signed this, fr the coming, this coming Friday. Friday, April the 8th. And when that happens, when the, when the Fijian people realize that these two parties are going to have complementary manifestos, they're going to they're going to partner and campaign together at various times during the election, standing, of course, as they're required by law to do as independent parties, but with an agreement, a solid, you know, concrete agreement to govern in coalition if they get, if their combined numbers exceed Fiji first. 
that we've got something here that's worth supporting, you know, because, you know, whatever you think about Fiji first, I think that 15 years on, it's time to change our underwear. Yeah, we've got to get, uh, we've got to, we've got to have a change of government. And my whole um, uh, reasoning, I suppose, for continuing to, to uh, devote much of my time to Fiji and matters is that we have unfinished business here. Yeah. We have not had a smooth transfer of government in Fiji at all in the last 52 years since independence. If you look at every single um, period in which an incumbent government was challenged and defeated, there's always been a struggle, yeah, whether, it was a, whether it's been coups, whether it's been sort of, you know, constitutional crises. We have not yet had a smooth transfer of government. So irrespective of the parties involved, I think that, you know, that, that we need to have that because we need to test uh, the mechanisms of our democracy and, and show that they work. And, will... and, and another thing, if I could just say this, because this is sure. extremely important. Um, you know, many people have their own copies at home of this. Uh, mine is actually sort of signed by, uh, by, by the then president, the prime minister, and I aside, Kayum, uh, mm -hmm. on, the, on the night of the, the 6th of September 2013. But in there is one of the most important sections of the constitution, which causes a lot of grief and a lot of people are upset about. Um, which is this, and, and it relates to the role of the Republic of Fiji military forces. It shall be the overall responsibility of the Republic of Fiji military forces to ensure at all times the security, defence and well-being of Fiji and all Fijians. Now, what I hope, and I know a lot of the senior people in the military, not particularly well, but obviously having been at the centre of government for so long, I regard them as honourable men and women, and what I would ask them, appeal to them to do on behalf of everybody is to honour that clause because uh, we look to the military to, to defend the right of the Fijian people to choose the government that they want at a free and fair election. And we also look to them to ensure the security of well and well-being of every Fijian so that that process takes place. Now, I'm hoping that those guys see their role as, as guaranteeing democracy in that sense, rather than, you know, this, this spectre and, and the continuing fear that somehow they will, you know, side with Frank Barney Marama to keep the man he calls the snake at bay. Um, so, look, fingers crossed, let's hope that this works. I think, it, I think it, it's the best thing that's happened in Fiji for a very, very long time. Wonderful analysis with that first question. I move to my second question now. You came out firing in your grub sheet post on Facebook this morning, where your headline was, and I quote, your FBC propaganda. You call the FBC news story as a, a breathtaking travesty of the facts. What irked you about this story? Because it didn't reflect anything that's ha that happened at the NFP AGM yesterday in terms of the substance of what happened there. The appearance of, of, by, of, 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 of Sitiveni Rambuka at the gathering, the speech that he made, the reception that he received. I mean, you know, the, the, the FBC reported this morning, um, you know, that, 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 that Beeman Prasad said it's time for Fiji to face some hard facts and not hide from them. Prasad adds that these facts include the military coup against an elected government in 1987 led by PAP leader Setaveni Rambuka. He adds that Rambuka became prime minister under a constitution that many opposed and was seen as racially divisive. The NFP leader claims these facts will be talked about by other political parties in the coming months. That wasn't the import of what happened at the AGM yesterday. And I just find it astonishing that the national broadcaster, the, the media outlet that we pay for, every Fijian pays for, uh, um, the state, you know, the, the, the public broadcaster in Fiji would, would, would twist the news in that way. I mean, we, we see it chronically, we constantly see it, um, unfortunately, from FBC and, of course, the other um, Fiji First um, propaganda outlet, the Fiji Sun. But, of course, you know, the greatest act of nepotism of the Fiji First Government has to be, it was to install the AG's brother as the chief executive officer 
of the Fijian Broadcasting Corporation. I mean, Riaz Syed Kayum, right, not only runs the FBC, has ha, is the editor-in-chief of FBC News, but also plays an active role in the re-election campaign of the Fiji First for the, uh, the Fiji First Party. And I know that for an absolute fact because I've been involved with him at, at very close quarters observing him do this. Um, and and I just think that this thing where the, the Fiji, you know, the FBC and and the Fiji Sun, you, you, you know, twist, bend, manipulate, lie, um, you know, uh, to to the constant advantage of the government. And in the case of um, Riaz Syed Kayum, the benefit of his brother who put him there is an absolute scandal. And, uh, you know, in relation to the FBC and the Sun, um, you know, I'm pressing um, and will continue to advocate for an independent media inquiry after the election happens to have an accounting for what has happened to the media in DG. Um, you know, a, a proper independent inquiry to bring the perpetrators of these uh, journalistic crimes against the people to justice. Um, whether that involves them, you know, being removed, whether that involves the proprietors in the case of CJ Patel of the Fiji Sun um, having to divest themselves of that of that newspaper, um, you know, uh, is for the inquiry to to determine or its terms of reference or whatever. But I don't think there's any doubt that 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 the media in Fiji um, ha, ha, there's been a full scale assault on the media in Fiji by the Fiji First Government. And, and the, you know, one of the worst things, not only about uh, the way in which these, you know, it's lackeys and toadies at the Fiji Sun and FBC have, have been allowed to get away with what they've been doing, is, is the draconian nature of the media laws. I mean, they, it used to apply to individual journalists as well as the, uh, you know, publishers, um, which was just an astonishing outrage. But now, of course, you know, the publishers of all of the media organisations in Fiji face um, you know, fifty thousand dollar fines or five years imprisonment. You know, for 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 very very broad uh, definitions of what you know what, what you know what 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 to anybody else would seem the most ridiculous offences. But there's another as aspect to this which is also very important. We need an inquiry as to why so many media outlets in Fiji and even the good ones like CFL, uh, Fiji Village why they have been restrained from telling the truth without fear or favor yeah um because of because of the climate of fear that has been instilled by Ayaz Said Kayum and Frank Barney Marama this you know it is a, a fundamental importance that this is dealt with by by uh in the event that the opposition parties you know win the next election and i and i, and I honestly think that sort of uh you know that the that the actions against the media are as important um, as as the other assaults on the institutions of state, which I'm keen to talk about in detail, and I might let you sort of lead me into those. We will. We will definitely talk about uh, other other aspects of uh, our discussion today regarding media, the constitution, and uh, other facets of uh, things that affect the Fijian people. Now, the impact. Let me ask you about your views. The impact that the People's Alliance and the NFP have created amongst the public, according to a number of people, is like a breath of fresh air. What, what reaction, I mean, you've worked with the AG, you've worked with the PM. What reaction do you think this will have on the two gentlemen, the PM and the AG, as the two key persons in, in government? We're going to have a lot of derision, uh, you know, they're going to scoff at this, yeah, because this is what they do. That, that, that's, their, that's their favorite tactic. They're going to deride this arrangement. They're going to say that, you know, that the NF, that Bim and Prasad uh, uh, sold the NFP out by getting into bed with the coup maker. Um, they're, going to, they're, they're going to pour scorn on the whole, the whole idea. But I know that they will have an acute level of apprehension and even fear about this, yeah, because it is, because it is the first realistic challenge to their authority in the country. And it's not just the electoral position. And we know, of course, that until, you know, what I uh, can only regard as the doctored uh, latest opinion, Fiji Sun uh, Western Force opinion poll that, that showed the prime minister, you know, going up an astonishing 14 points 
you know, the, the poll that was published on Friday. Until then, of course, you know, Sidoveni Rambuka has been the clear front runner to win this election. So the combination of, of him and the People's Alliance and Bim Prasad and the NFP and the support that they're bound to get from uh, well, the other candidates that both of these parties are going to announce in the election lead up, plus a groundswell of public sentiment, hopefully in their direction, from, from people on all sides, yeah, because, because there is now no reason not to vote for them, no matter who you are, no matter what background that you have in Fiji, this will strike the fear of God into the heart of Ayaz Syed Kayum and Frank Barney Marama. Okay. Now, Fiji has had 15 long years of the Fiji First government. How do you gauge the sentiments in the country? Is there really a call for change? I mean, I've heard from people that I talk to that there is a cry out there, uh, be it a silent cry, that uh, there is a need for change. I don't think there's any doubt whatsoever that there's a that, that there's a momentum and a groundswell of opinion for change. I mean, the problem has been up until now, um, you know, who do we change to? And, you know, until this deal has been announced, you know, um, you know, I suppose the intelligentsia and, you know, elements of the Itake, Indo-Fijian community and, and others, as they used to be called, would naturally go to the NFP. Uh, I think I, I don't think there's any doubt that Rambuka has cut the legs off Sedelpa. Yeah, I mean, I I personally believe that Sedelpa will be struggling to make the five percent threshold at the, at the next election. They're in complete disarray, and I think we can also expect defections from further defections from Sedelpa. You know, following Linda Tambuya into into the the People's Alliance. Um, so, yeah, look, it's going to be interesting whether whether this can work. I mean, my understanding is that there are elements of the People's Alliance who were reluctant to do this deal on the basis, really, that uh, just that they thought that they could win on their, you know, in their own right. But 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 the problem with that would be that they would be burdened with this perception that it's Sedelpa light or that Bani Marama was just using this as a as a vehicle to kind of become prime minister again. Um, what, I mean, what 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 Bim and Prasad and 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 the NFP have done have have given given a sort of sense of credibility to this thing, and in, in in the way that I've already explained by bringing in all this fresh blood and people who are respected in the community, but also extremely competent. Yeah, so I think that's that's transformed things. And I look, I honestly think that people are just fed up with Frank, and you know, you know, they're fed up with Ayers. Yeah. I mean, whatever, whatever, you know, attractiveness they once had is dissipated because, you know, the prime minister has gone to another place. You know, he, he he's essentially lazy. You know, he, he doesn't lead. He, he turns up expecting to be lauded and he get, gets handed a, a you know, piece of paper with words written for him or, or, or put onto his iPad. He delivers them and then goes. The hard yards in the government are done by the AG. Um, but the AG isn't isn't really cutting it any longer. Yeah, I mean, he, there's a sort of the element of desperation has set in here, and of course things have things have been going against them that they ha over which they have no control. You, you know, the, nobody saw the COVID ep pandemic co coming, and you know, so so Fiji deserves consideration for that, which of course its its development partners and you know the banks have kind of done, and you know, we, 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 we've been given sort of billions of dollars to to sort of you know get over this particular thing, but but they're showing signs of an extremely tired government, and it's really not surprising after fifteen years. I mean, I I don't want to personalize this in any way, but but. But in every democracy, you need to have a churn. You know, you need after a period of, of a government in office in which they're doing good things, um, you know, after they become tired, um, they need to be shown the door to go onto the opposition benches and renew themselves. I mean, this is not the pattern in, in, in Fiji as it is in Australia, New Zealand and other democracies. But it's, as I said before, it's about time that it, it became like that. You know, we have to we have to accept that there are smooth transfers of power every now and again because it's good for the governance of Fiji. And I must say that under Fiji first, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm pained to say this because of my own role um, over the years in supporting them, but the governance of, F of Fiji under Fiji first has deteriorated. I mean, the mere fact that they can't keep the power 
uh, and the water on in vast areas of the country and particularly the capital city just indicates to me that they've totally lost the plot. I mean, you can get on a, on a, a, on a state-of-the-art Airbus A350, which few airlines have. You know, they're designed for massive, you know, distances and intercontinental thing. We've got two of those leased. The fact that, that, that you can get on this kind of state-of-the-art aircraft and fly to Los Angeles or Sydney doesn't impress me one iota if they can't keep the power on or the water on. Um, you know, I mean, I, I mean, seriously, I mean, I made a, a little quip before about, you know, things not being that much different to my childhood in terms of access to power. But there's no excuse for this stuff. Yeah, you, there's, we, we haven't had cyclones all the time that they, that they shouldn't have improved the basic in, infrastructure. Um, you know, and I, and I just think that people have had enough of this. OK, um, have a drink of water if you need to. Um, you are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point, and our chief guest this afternoon is Mr. Graham Davis, communication specialist and founder and publisher of Grubsheet. Please share the SSTP page and this interview with family and friends if you can. Don't forget to like and follow the SSTP page as well. Now, some of uh, my personal contacts are trying to send me private messages let me just say to you that I can't have access to private messages during the program. If you'd like to put any comments, please use the comments page on SSTP. Now, Graham, I believe you worked for the Fiji Sun for some years. What were you doing? No, no, I, didn't, I didn't work for the Fiji Sun. What, oh. what happened was that I published my Grubsheet Fiji website page and the Fiji Sun uh, took it upon themselves to use that material. We never did a contractual deal. I wasn't paid a cent from the Fiji Sun. I didn't have any problem with them using it because they didn't doctor it. Um, but no, I've never worked for the Fiji Sun. And in fact, I've never worked for the Fijian government. I mean, I, 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 I was contracted to work for Corvus in Fiji. Um, so the notion that I, you know, the government got fed up with me and sacked me is just nonsense. I'll come to that very shortly because I have a direct question to ask you. Now, let's uh, get a bit closer to some facts. When and how did you first meet Vorengi Mbani Marama? Um, well, I know exactly when I met uh, Bani Marama because it was before the 2006 coup. And I went to Fiji for Channel 9, the Sunday program at Channel 9, which was a weekly current affairs program that no longer exists, but you know, did serious journalism in the region. Um, and I interviewed him during that period where he's very upset with the Garase government. Um, so that was the first time he and I met. Um, and then, of course, we met on successive occasions after that. You know, I, I wasn't happy with the 2006 coup, um, but I understood why it had happened. You know, we were in a situation in which um, we were getting further away from, from, from the principal of equality, of, of, of a fair go for everybody, yeah? Um, and so right from the start, I supported the, the notion of establishing a level playing field in Fiji, equal votes of equal value, uh, and, and the fundamental principles that, that Brian Marama enunciated at the time that were central to, to his mission. And of course, it, it was motivated, you know, on my part from, from you know, from what I was talking about before, the, the the very strong ethics in my family or ethos in my family that Fiji could only survive as a multiracial, multi-religious, thriving community. And if I could just add to that, you know, my my father was so embroiled in in politics in the 1960s that he even stood in the 1966 election uh, as an independent. Yeah, which was an astonishing thing to do for a clergyman at the time. But he was also the director of social services for the Methodist Church. Um, you know, we, we, you know, around the family table, it was about politics. You know, I mean, you know, everybody acknowledged the ascendancy of Ratu Mara. Um, you know, the Alliance Party was dominant, but my father was never going to stand for the Alliance Party. In fact, he stood against the Alliance Party. He lost, um, but but you know, he you know, it was always about producing equity for people yeah and if, and it's, it's 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 been ingrained in me all my life you know I'm, i i've always been you know aware that in fiji those who have the least often give the most yeah 
Um, I mean, I, again, it's hard, it's hard to um, think back without getting emotional because, because it's been our lived experience, you know, in Fiji. It, it's essentially a very caring place, you know. Ordinary people are extremely caring. And, I asked um, you, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I John, I've, you, I've, 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 I've digressed. <laughs> I, I asked you, when did you first meet uh, Mr. Mbani Marama? My follow-up question is, what was your first impression of the man? Oh, you know, tough talking thing. I mean, look, I, I mean, Frank, Frank, Frank shows aspects of being a thug, but you know, there's a, there's a sort of soft element to the guy, which I, which always quite appealed to me. You know, um, he's quite a sentimental person, you know, which which anybody who knows him, you know, under, understands. So. You know, when I was up close with him and he was doing his big sort of, you know, swagger grunt routine, you know, I'd sort of tease him about it, really. You know, I'd just give him a throwaway line or, you know, to di to, to diffuse the situation and he'd laugh, you know. I mean, um, I'm, I'm just trying to think, you know, I, I guess, you know, he always... I mean, I did an interview with him for Sky News, you know, and I mean, at the time I was sympathetic to him and I probably gave him a bit of a free ride but he um you know he very he very ably expressed what he was all about and that and in, in, in a simple sentence he said i want to remove race as the basis for everything in fiji you know the emphasis on race now i i absolutely believed uh you know that the, the, the same thing is a fundamental article of faith so in my early years of support for the for the Fiji first government and the prime minister in particular, I was definitely a true believer. Yeah, you know, I believed it. Um, I probably didn't realize that sort of you know power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely in the way that I now understand it. Um, but you know, we, I, my narrative that I produced for them working for Corvus, you know, in speeches and 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 in terms of messaging and what what have you was about you know the being inclusive yeah it was about um you know a level playing field for all fijians you know a fair go for all you know taking leaving nobody behind taking everybody with us um and you know i my whole uh, emphasis doing the work for corvus was you know to go high you know when if the opponents go low you go high go high keep going higher yeah because and I, th I think it worked. You know, I remember in 2014, you know, the, the repeated mantra in all the speeches I wrote was, we deliver, as in services, we serve, as, as in we are a government that is at your service, giving you the things that you need to, to improve your lot and the lot of your families and, 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 and the notion of service. Now, call me, call me sort of deluded or call me high-minded or call me the you know, uh, the missionary kid. Um, and, and you know, there's doubtless that there's a, an element of naivety in, in, in what I believed in then. Uh, I've actually been very shocked in recent years at the way in which that has all been cast aside. And, and I think now it's, you know, power at all costs. And I'm, you know, as I've, as I've explained repeatedly in my writing, my final break with the Barney Moran. I'll stop you there. Okay. Because... I don't want you to jump the gun. I want you to take us through certain steps till okay. we get to that. So I'm not going to let you steal my thunder, so to say, uh, because I'm going to progressively take you through a path. No, thunder wrong. Now, now I, I asked you about uh, your meeting the Prime Minister. Um, now, when and how did you meet uh, Ayaz Sayed Kayum, and uh, what uh, were your first impressions of the gentleman? Well, I didn't meet Ayaz Sayed Kayum until I was, you know, approached by Corvus asking me whether I'd be a consultant on their account in Fiji. And that came completely out of the blue when I was doing other work um, in 2012. Um, I was doing a television program, fronting a TV program at the time, so I could only go to Fiji, you know, for half the week and it was flying back and forward. Um, and of course, I was I was taken in by the Corvus representative in Suva at the time to meet the AG. But I'd heard a lot about him. Obviously, I knew a lot about him. And you know, I have to say, he was pretty wary of me. You know, I mean, I I think he's much more comfortable with the Americans because they they don't have an emotional stake in Fiji, and and you know, they're essentially there to do his bidding. 
Um, so yeah, he was pretty wary of me. And in fact, I was quite surprised because I got a phone call, you know, from his father, Syed Kayum, who everybody remembers, you know, he's always at the parliament and has a huge influence uh, at the parliament in the gallery, in the public gallery, and has a huge influence on his son. I got a phone call from him to go to lunch at the Maya Daba. And I, and so I went there and I, I was aware that I was basically being checked out, you know, mm. um, but I, but when I said to him, which is what I, which as I did, that I would like to think that one day in Fiji, your son could be prime minister. You know, I, I believed it. Yeah. I mean, I'd seen enough of him to, to think that, you know, he was extremely clever and extremely committed and, and really, it wasn't about the person. It was about the principle, you know. And in fact, I said, I said, the first successful Indo-Fijian, um, you know, p prime minister in Fiji, because, of course, I don't regard Mahendra Chowdhury as, as having been successful merely because he lost office in the way that he did. Um, and then, of course, I must have got the seal of approval from, from the father. And, and then the AG and I over the succeeding years became extremely close. I mean, my final meeting with the AG, my final meeting with the AG before I left Fiji, I mean, he embraced me and thanked me for, 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 for the, for what I'd, you know, what I'd done for the, for the cause, so to speak. So, yeah. Um, I mean, I got to know him very, very well. Um, I, ha I have to say, you know, there's, there's, there's things about him that are very attractive as, as, as I'm sure people watching, you know, who know him, um, will it, you know, will it, will attest to, um, he's got a lovely family. His wife is delightful, you know, Ella. um, and you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of good things about the guy, but unfortunately I don't think there's a democratic bone in his body. I mean, he's, he's just a sort of born autocrat. Um, and you know, it's, it's become a real, a real problem. I mean, it's it, with him, it's always my way or the highway, you know, um, and it worried me when I was working for him, but it but it sure worries me now because there's been a concerted uh, assault on the institutions of state, which I know you've said I can't talk about until you ask. We'll, me we'll discuss that. We'll yeah. discuss that now. Um, what was your earliest work uh, in public advocacy for the prime minister? Uh, you said that you, or well, maybe before that, when did you join Corvus for the Fiji operations? I joined. I joined. I I got a phone call from a, from an American guy, who identified himself as coming from Corvus in the middle of 2012, and he said, "You know, can I come to lunch?" And he came to lunch, and we for hours and hours we spoke about Fiji, and you know th they had noticed what I was writing on Grubsheet Fiji, and so they sort of figured that maybe I had something to offer, uh, you know, them in Fiji. So I went to Fiji first on a part-time basis in, in September 2012, as I recall it. And I mean, you know, I mean, I over the over the coming months and years, I did everything in relation to well, all, when I may say everything, I mean the full gamut of you know public affairs, public relations, um, you know, writing press releases, um, writing the prime minister's speeches. And of course I did hundreds of those, if, if not thousands, because, you know, sometimes you do three or four a day. And, and so that was a major part of the, of the job. Uh, but also sort of, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, I, some of my work survives funnily enough. I mean, the, the prayer that opens the parliament, every parliamentary session I wrote, yeah. And I wrote it on an instruction from the, from the, from the AG to give me a prayer in 15 minutes. One night, you know, I got a phone call saying, you know, we need a prayer and we need it in 15 minutes. And I, I'd, so I sat down at my computer and I belted it out and it's still being read out by the speaker, you know, every time the parliament sits. I mean, the, the, you know, I'm already unpopular with a lot of people, but they, and, and to admit this will probably make me more unpopular, but I'm the one who's responsible for the, you know, the road outside the, the parliament being changed to Constitution Avenue. That was my, my idea. Um, you know, I organized all sorts of things, you know, whether it's Constitution Day, you know, ceremonies or Girmit Day ceremonies. Um, and I did a lot of, you know, at the, at the uh, you know, at the, with the, with the blessing and authority of the AG and the Prime Minister, a lot of public advocacy stuff with the diplomatic community, for instance, in Suva, explaining to them, you know, what the government was doing and, and all sorts of things like that and of course once i finished my work with corvus i moved on to the climate um 
you know, Fiji's climate and oceans campaign, um, you know, COP23. So I continued to work for Fiji for a period after I left Corvus for Baker McKenzie, the lawyers, and which became Pollination. So, so that's, yeah, that's essentially a, 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 a tour of the horizon of what I did in Fiji. All right. Well, let me see if I got this correct. You were contracted to Corvus, worked for them, I believe, under contract. Yes? Yeah. Okay. So as a consultant, were, yeah. So yeah, in other words, I wasn't, I wasn't a, on, on the Corvus staff, yeah? Uh, yeah. And in fact, my title was Asia Pacific Consultant because they intended to use me on other, you know, to do other work. I mean, at one stage, you know, very early on in Fiji, they rang me and said, oh, you know, could you go to Saudi Arabia? Well, I wasn't interested in doing Saudi Arabia. I was interested in, 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 in helping the government, you know, get, 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 you know, get, get Fiji's act together. So, um, so that's how that happened. I, so I never worked for the Fijian government. Yeah, and that's I never, what I was trying to I never, worked right? for, I never worked for Corvus. I was, I was a kind of contract worker. Yeah, yeah so that was, that's exactly what I was trying to establish Mm. that you were never an employee of the Fijian government? Never. All right, so we've I've solved I've never that. been an employee of the Fijian government. All right, I heard you say a few moments ago that uh, um, I'd like to discuss the sort of work you did um, mm. as a consultant. Um, and I heard you say that a few moments ago. Uh, one could well imagine government communications, I guess, prime minister's speeches, speeches for other ministers. Would that all form part of your 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 duty i guess your your task uh yeah i mean look some of the some of the i mean the the, the actual uh, you know workings of the internal workings of corvus in in fiji i can't talk about yeah because yeah. i signed a confidentiality agreement with them and i and, and i'm going to honor that um but i don't mind talking in general about about what i did so all you know tick yes to all of the all of those things that you just mentioned i mean i as i say i mean i you know i i think the speeches for the prime minister were the most important things we did because in a sense they became you know the holy writ for the rest of the cabinet you know people would take uh, the messaging from the prime minister's speeches and it would filter through you know the other minister, ministerial portfolios and become you know the narrative yeah and of course, I was I was I was deeply aware as I wrote that narrative of what I've what I talked about before that the that the strength of Fiji first was its inclusivity, that sort of it was about creating a level playing field, about creating opportunity, and a lot of good things were done. I mean, I mentioned you know the the um, you know the the the, the uh, integration of the schools which was an astonishing thing to do really i mean suddenly you know i mean i know you went to to, to nandi muslim college you know so all of those uh labels were sort of you know um got rid of you know people had to t had to take uh you know people of other ethnicities into the schools and i mean you'll see you'll see around nandi after school now you know eat and you know what is it, Shalmar Kameez? Is it the the flying? Shalmar Kameez. Yeah, Shalmar yeah. Kameez, yeah. And, and and I think that that's absolutely wonderful because I think we're already seeing the benefits of that now. I mean, I, I was astonished the other day that that at the youth wing of the People's Alliance, two of the four office bearers elected at that gathering were Indo-Fijians. I mean, this is supposed to be Rambuka, you know, the the kind of you know the in, indigenous supremacist and and. And I think that's a reflection of the changes that have been made, that, that kids nowadays are, and young people are growing up in an integrated environment and realising that, I mean, you know, you'd have to say that what, what happened in previous years was a form of, of, of apartheid, really, because people were brought, be, being brought up in separate communities and then being brought together in an unnatural way to, you know, in, this, in these expressions of nationhood, whereas now... The kids are growing up in the same classrooms. They're in the same lecture theatres and what have you. And this is a fantastic thing. Um, I remember being extremely m emotional the night that I was writing the 2013 budget, which which had the free schooling initiative. Um, you know, that was just an astonishing thing for the Fiji First Government to have delivered. You know, and I and I, I salute them for having done that because. I know I knew from my own experience as a kid, you know, the number of parents who'd come to my, you know, to see my father asking for help because they couldn't afford the school fees. 
you know so that, that fiji first has done a huge amount of good i mean it, and that has to be accepted yeah? I, I mean uh, you know and 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 i think it is i think people understand that but they have been in power for too long and they have lost the plot and I know I'm not allowed to say it until you mention it, but but it's the assault on the institutions of state that finally led to my breach with them. Now, a question that many, many people would uh, like an answer to. Who did you report to and where would your instructions come from? Was it from the PM's office or from the AG's office or directly from Corvus? Well, my, my ultimate boss was the head of the Corvus account in Washington, yeah, oh. who's, a, who's a wonderful fellow. And, you know, I, I don't have a bad word to say about Corvus, yeah? I mean, I think they had a very strong appreciation of the, of the propriety of their role. I mean, I, you know, the, I, 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 I was never party to, nor did I witness, anything that Corvus did in Fiji to approach, you know, the, 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 the fakery and the, and the travesty of, of this kind of off, this Vartis offshoot with their false identities and, and false pages. I mean, Corvus has never been involved with that, as far as I know. And there was also a sort of level of high-mindedness. I mean, Corvus loved Fiji because, you know, it had it had all sorts of sort of, you know, dodgy, dodgy people, you know, including Saudi Arabia's clients. And Fiji was this kind of little gem, you know. So um, the people I worked with at Corvus were were people of integrity and 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 um, and you know competence. But, uh, but 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 I, but I took my instructions on it to answer your question. I took my yes. instructions on a day to day level from the AG. I worked in the AG's office. Um, you know, I, I spent most of my wor working day, you know, uh, either in in his vicinity or or, or or at the end of a phone call. Um, you know, I it was it was to the extent of you know I would I would arrive at Sydney Airport and turn my phone on, and as I, as I was getting the bags out of the locker, it'd be the AG on the on the telephone, or call, calling me as I was you know as as the as the host as the sort of flight stewards were wanting to wrest my mobile phone out of my hand, and I was saying, oh, so it's the AG. Well, of course, you know, yes, yes, of course, it's the AG. <laughs> you know, so we had a very close relationship. Okay, now. Uh... I know you've spoken about the confidentiality arrangement you had with Corvus. Mm. I will ask you, and I don't know whether you can answer this. Um, were you ever aware of the Corvus contract, what, what it was worth in terms of uh, its uh, relationship with the Fijian government? I believe uh, I read somewhere that it was in the vicinity of around 800K or a million dollars a year. Any comments on that? Well, I can speak about that because it's on the public record. I mean, the the the, the AG has given the Parliament, um, and it's in the it's in the budget papers. I mean, for the you know for the first few years when I was there, uh, it was a million Fijian. Yeah, so I think at the time it was like four hundred and sixty or eighty thousand US, and then a couple of years ago, as I understand it, it was reduced to eight hundred thousand Fijian a year. Um, that's all I know, and it's really just you know what was what was there. I mean, it, 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 to, to tell you the truth, the nature of their relationship with the government wasn't on my wasn't on my orbit because I wasn't a Corvus staffer. I mean, you know, if 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 Corvus wanted to speak business with the AG, somebody from Washington came down to talk to him. I wasn't involved with any of that, and I, of course, I okay. wasn't on the Corvus staff. Sure, and mm. your checks were written by Corvus. You you mean my pay is it? yes my, yeah yeah no I I was paid by Corvus yes so we yeah. make that distinction that uh, Fijian I never government took money from the Fijian government it came out of whatever the Fijian government paid Corvus sure now Graham you've been described as uh, and I quote the most influential spin doctor for Mr Mbani Barama firstly what does a spin doctor do well I mean the spin a spin doctor. You know, puts the best possible complexion on whatever you know he he has to has to you know portray. Um, but but you know, I'll make this point, and it and it's it's very very important. You can't put lipstick on a pig. Yeah, you can try, but but everybody's going to say it's still a pig. Yeah. So uh, the the successful spin of any government, and this included the Bani Marama government, was that you would hone in on those things positive that it was doing. And you would put them in the best possible light, you know, which which I never had a problem with because, 
you know, I believed in that agenda. I mean, look, unlike other Corvus people there who were there because, you know, they were sent to Fiji, I went to Fiji at their invitation, wanting to be in Fiji and wanting to be part of the Bainimarama revolution, if you want to call it that, you know. Um, so, you know, I, I, can't, I can't recall a single thing that I did in, in Fiji. And, of course, I'm, I'm called grubby by a lot of people, you know, as, as a play, I suppose, on, on my blog site, website, whatever, whatever. And, and, you know, people accuse me of behaving in a grubby fashion. But I, I honestly can't remember a single thing that I did that I'm ashamed of. I mean, I've done things that I, that I didn't want to do at the time, but that's what you have to do with a client, you know. And the principal one of that, of course, was the AG's, you know, the AG's, you know, desire and, you know, to, to change the flag, which I was extremely unhappy about. But but I was working to him as an elected member of, you know, the government, um, you know, and a client of the people I was contracted to. And so I dutifully put, you know, the best possible complexion I could on on his, you know, desire to change the flag. Um, even the, even though it didn't coincide with my own, um, and you know that I suppose that was the biggest thing that I had. You know, when you're sitting at the keyboard and you're thinking, Shh, you know, I really don't want to say this or I don't want to do this. That's the thing that really stuck in my craw because one, they didn't have a mandate to do it. Two, he was openly saying that he was doing it to please his father. You know, mm. it was it was all part of this anti-British thing. Let's get rid of all of the colonial symbols. And and so I had a visceral, uh, you know. <sighs> um you know opposition to it but but you know you i still sort of you know put lipstick on a pig of an idea mm. now your work or did it just involve the sort of influencing so to say the general public or were you also responsible for influencing other groups such as diplomats uh, leaders of uh, foreign countries uh, overseas media for example including the Prime Minister and the Attorney General? Um, as I think I mentioned before, I mean, the Prime Minister and the AG gave me uh, the authority to have contact with, independent contact with, with the diplomatic corps in addition to their contacts with foreign affairs. And, and so and that, that was obviously something that was quite valuable because if you remember at the time, um, there was a lot of hostility towards Fiji, especially from Australia and New Zealand. Um, and that dissipated after 2000, after the return to democracy in 2014. And I remember getting uh, a phone call from the Australians, uh, you know, who, who who had never invited me, even as a sort of dual Australian that Fijian national, to any any embassy, uh, any high commission function, including Australia Day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, inviting me to lunch because you know Fiji had, had basically, you know, done what they wanted. You know, return to democracy finally, and so we were sort of in polite society again. Um, and I saw my role during that era to, you know, to to brief uh, diplomats in a in a in a sort of informal way on the positive things that Fee was doing, and particularly, uh, you know, in the build up to the Oceans campaign and the COP campaign, because we were trying to get money uh, from these governments for for this. So a lot of that was kind of, you know. The, the, the big carry carry, you know. Look, this is we're doing this for the for, for for the benefit of the world, and and the global community. You know, we can't do it without without money. You know, can you help? And 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 of course, somebody like myself, who's a you know who's a sort of you know a, a journalist, can, can be a lot more um, shame, <laughs> shameless, I suppose, in asking diplomats for these things than than somebody who you know works for foreign affairs. I mean, there's some fantastic people in in that foreign engagement area. I mean, one of the one of the one of my favourite people in Fiji, uh, in a professional sense and a personal sense, is Yogesh Karan, the you know the permanent secretary for foreign affairs, who's who's you know a, a, an exceptional individual, um, as is Shavada Sharma, the solicitor general. But that's another story which I'll let you. Ask we'll about. touch on that story in a little while. Um, have a drink of water if you need to, Graham. You're watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point with our chief guest, Mr. Graham Davis, publisher and owner of uh, Grub Sheet, uh, a column on uh, Facebook. And um, if you have uh, joined us for the first time on SSTP, welcome. 
please like the page and uh, follow the page so you get instantaneous notifications of uh, all our trailers, all our posters, and notifications of future programs. Now, let me start this next phase of our interview, Graham. The new Fiji under the Bani Marama regime. How were you promoting the new Fiji, particularly overseas? Because I remember after the coup, things were pretty dicey in terms of uh, foreign governments. And there was this need, I guess uh, you joined them in 2012, you said. Um, he had an agenda of uh, taking Fiji to democracy in around 2009, I believe. So Yeah, and he'd... And he'd 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 obviously breached that promise to return Fiji to democracy in two thousand and nine. I had absolutely no part in the government's official uh, information effort uh, between two thousand and six until I went there in late two thousand and twelve. I mean, apart from the advocacy that I did as a private citizen, you know, unpaid, um, I had nothing to do with it. But we all know that 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 Barney Marama promised. Um, I think it was the Commonwealth. Um, that he would return to Fiji, Fiji's democracy in 2009, and he hadn't kept that promise. Um, in 2013, and I remember it as clear as day because it was the the arrival, uh, uh, during the arrival of the first Airbus A330, uh, uh, you know, you remember Air Pacific became Fiji Airways and they bought these Airbuses. Um, and it will always stick in my mind because I was there with the Prime Minister and he said to me, Oi, Grim. I'm uh, I'm thinking of not having the election. I'm thinking of having a referendum on whether to have an election. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I mean, I almost died, you know, because we'd promised the world we were going to do it. And um, and I said, Prime Minister, don't do that. Yeah, please don't do that. Yeah, we're, um, we can win fair and square because you know, you, you know, you you've done what needed what's what's needed to be done to have the country on side. And I really believe that. And uh, and so. You know, I was told later, you know, by the AG that that had that had been a decisive factor in uh, in in producing or or, or or getting the timetable for getting back to uh, the 2014 election, getting that back on track. OK, now, what was your personal opinion about democracy being present in Fiji post the 2006 coup? Um, was democracy alive in Fiji then? After 2006? Yes. No, 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 of course not. There was nothing. <laughs> I mean, it was right. a dictatorship. Yeah, the people did what, what Frank and I has told them to do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't until the formation of other political parties, you know, in, the, in, in, in advance of 2014 that there was any formal, uh, you know, input uh, other than, you know, our way or the highway. All right. Now, I refer to one of your Grubsheed blog articles titled Mbani Marama Attacks Credibility of Former Fiji Vendetta Journalists. You will probably recall that allegations were made by two former Fiji journalists that uh, Mbani Marama tried to mount three coups before his successful takeover in 2006. It was alleged that the first was when he tried to take over the country after the Spade coup in 2000, and mm. then again in 2004 and 2005. You mentioned that you interviewed Mr. Mbani Marama in relation to these allegations. Was there any semblance of truth in these allegations? Well, look, all I can say is not to my knowledge. You know, okay. I, I I don't know that. Yeah, I mean, okay. you know, we all know that in you know that Frank Barney Rama played played a decisive role in bringing the Spate Rebellion to an end. You know, there's a, there's a lot of shadowy toing and froings during that period, which I you know, unless uh, Barney Rama writes his you know autobiography or dictates it to somebody else, that we'll, that we'll never know about. You know, um, but no, I wasn't aware of it. Okay. Now, was there ever any truth that after the 2006 coup, Barney Marama allegedly demanded that the military be given the authority to rule Fiji for 50 years, but that this was opposed by the then president, Ratu, Ratu Josefa Iloilo? Again, I have absolutely no, no, no uh, knowledge of that. In fact, I've, I'm hearing it from you for the first time. Okay. All right. 
Now, uh, what was the PR machine like leading up to the 2014 elections? Uh, how busy was the Corvus office in putting a positive spin on things? Well, it was it was it was intense, but it's always intense, you know, uh, in these circumstances. You know, sovereign work is is very intense. You know, there's, there's no sort of days off. You know, um, there were two of us, myself and another Corvus guy, who was extremely uh, popular and well regarded and extremely competent, um, and we we worked, you know, like blazers, really. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I even when I came back to to see you know, my Marama and kids in, 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 in Sydney, um, I'd be working. Yeah. All the time. Okay. I mean, you know, I mean, the, the, you, there's one thing about the AG that everybody, I think every, everyone who works for him understands whether you're in the civil service or whatever, you know, it never stops. The guy's a workaholic. Yeah. Which means that everybody around him is expected to be a workaholic. And I mean, you know, there is some truth to the fact that, you know, my, my health deteriorated over those years. I mean, I wasn't a spring ch chicken. I'd had a journalistic career, at that stage for almost 40 years. In fact, next year, I'll have been a journalist for 50 years. So, you know, right. you do get on and, and you know, you, you, have, you have to sleep. I remember once uh, writing a budget in Fiji. I didn't sleep for three days. Okay. Literally, other than a snooze, yeah. I mean, it was very demanding work. Now, Graham, just after the 2014 elections, you published The New Democracy Begins. Mm. You paid very glowing tribute to the Prime Minister of Oringimbani Marama, you said, and I quote, Voringen Banimarama has seized his place in history by blessing his opponents and scoring a decisive win in the first genuinely democratic election in Fiji since independence 44 years ago. Mm. By any standard, it is a remarkable achievement because this is no run-of-the-mill election win of the kind the world routinely witnesses a changing of the political guard under a tried and tested order, end of quote. Mm. You said the first genuinely democratic election in Fiji since independence 44 years ago. This was at the time of writing your yeah. article. Yeah. What did you mean by that? Weren't elections post-independence democratic? No, because the, it wasn't on the the votes weren't on the basis of of equality. Yeah. Some vote some votes, some the votes of some people worth were were more worth more than others. Yeah. We, we didn't have, um, you know, a, a, an equal democracy until until the Fiji first um, imposed democracy, if you like. Yeah, because it eradicated race as a, as, a, as a basis for 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 the electoral system and anything, actually. I mean, including, you know, the common identity and what have you. So I did regard that as the first genuine democracy in terms of the voting system. The question that I think you're probably getting to is, is it a true democracy because of the way in which they've stacked the institutions in their favor and against everyone else? And that's a completely different, this, that's a completely different, you know, question. Uh, true. You, you know, the, 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 the program at the time, I don't think can be faulted. There's certainly no indication, as far as I can see, from any political party that they're going to turn back the clock so that the, the voting system is weighted in favour of the Itau K, which is what happened before. There's no need for it anyway, because the you know we don't we no longer have a majority Indo-Fijian population and all those fears no longer apply. Um, but yeah, I don't resile from that one iota. Okay. Now, why, in your opinion, was the 2014 election a no run of the mill election win of the kind routinely witnessed, a changing of the political guard, as you said? Well, be, well, for precisely that reason, that ever since independence in Fiji, we'd had a racially weighted electoral system, and for the first time, we had equal votes of equal value. I mean, it's mm -hmm. as simple as that, really. Um, and I don't think anybody can really argue about that. But it, but I repeat, <laughs> you can yeah. have equal votes of equal value, but is it a genuine democracy? And I would have to say that you know Fiji First has been has been artful in in creating you know, the appearance of a genuine democracy, but 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 in, in fact not producing one at all. All right. Now, Which what I was the... you to ask me about first? <laughs> yeah, I'm coming to when it. The time comes. I'm coming to it. Now, what was the game changer in the 2014 elections? 
insofar as the Fiji First Party was concerned? Well, I think look, there were a couple of factors, weren't there? I mean, I think Barney Marama had an ascendancy in the country, which was undeniable. I mean, he might have come to power in a coup in 2006 or a takeover, as they prefer to call it. Um, but he'd built a constituency in the country. He was extremely popular. I mean, at one stage, I remember, you know, the Fiji, for, sorry, the Fiji Sun um, polls uh, in, in, in 2014, you know, giving him 86% of the vote. It was astonishing. And even the Lowy Institute, uh, in a very controversial poll they did pre, pre the 2014 election, uh, established that he had 67% popular support. So this was a significant achievement for the guy. It can't be taken away from him. I mean, he, he morphed from a dictator into an elected prime minister uh, in a textbook way. And I do believe that he did that um, on the basis of one, service delivery, because if you remember, billions were spent on roads and bridges and all these kind of things. And, uh, and you know, and also I think he, you know, I mean, and I'm, not, I'm not sort of, you know, um, making any great point about this, but but his message was was up there. You know, it was kind of, you know, we, I did this for you. I did this to make us all equal. You know, there's no longer second class citizens in Fiji. We, you know, we all have the same rights and opportunities. Um, you know, people can make their individual judgments on whether or not that's turned out to be the case. But I don't think it can be taken away from the Fiji First Government and, and Barney Marama and Kayum that that's what they did. I don't have a problem with that. In fact, I never had a problem with them until they started, you know, this full frontal assault on the institutions of state, you know, the abolition of, this, of, this, of the assessors, the FICAC court, and then this horrendous breach of the Constitution we've seen in recent times in relation to the sacking of the SG. All right. Well, like I said, and I repeat, I will be discussing those matters with you. Um, you said after the 2014 elections that um, Bani Marama was then regarded as the best person to deliver a united future, to offer a vision of progress and hope. What led you to reach this conclusion, and uh, was his vision of progress and hope delivered? Well, I mean, it's, I think the results of the 2014 election speak for themselves. I mean, he won the election, you know, and he won it handsomely and decisively. They had a, they had a tremendous mandate mandate from the country. And if you recall, um, you, you, you know, Barney Marama and Kayum were riding high between 2014 and sometime during the second term, um, or the, you know, between the 2014 election and 2018. Um, it's hard to know where they went off the rails in terms of public sentiment, but I, but 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 you know they only just scraped back into office in 2018 with 50.02 percent of the vote. But the problem is they've behaved ever since as if sort of you know they're still the you know the top dogs, uh, and they're not. Now, in your opinion, Graham, how difficult was it for the Fiji First government to govern in its first full term of? Uh government post-elections, 2014? I didn't discern that it was hard for them to govern and because they had a decisive mandate and a lot of things were going in Fiji's favour. I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's hard, isn't it, to sort of look back and sort of, you know, at, at, what, a, at what a golden age it was in, in many ways because the tourists were arriving and spending money. You know, there, there were, the, the government was confident that we could get to a million tourists, you know, uh, pretty easily. Um, Fiji's status in the Pacific was, you know, was, you know, had, had been enhanced incredibly, you know. I mean, I remember the, the you know, the then president, Ratu Apelli Nailati Kao, going on a tour of Pacific countries after Fiji had offered to, to take uh, climate refugees from Kiribati and Tuvalu. And, you, you know, people in the audience were crying that this was happening, yeah? I mean... <laughs> Barney Marama became a regional statesman and then he went on to become a global statesman with the Oceans campaign and the and the and the climate action campaign. So I don't think it's in any dispute whatsoever that they were riding high. And of course the level of service delivery, you couldn't you couldn't you couldn't escape the Prime Minister um you know, going to the opening of a, of a school, going to the opening of a health centre, going to the opening of a road, going to the opening of a bridge. Unfortunately, it also descended into going to the, going to the launch of a, of a new garbage truck. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, everywhere he went, people were very pleased to see him. Yeah. 
they still are, but now I think it's more innate Fijian politeness. Our chief guest this afternoon is Mr. Graham Davis, communications specialist, founder and publisher of Grubsheet, the widely read internet site and Facebook page on Fijian politics. Please share the link on your timeline so that you may include your family and friends in this broadcast. And I remind you that a full recording of this program can also be viewed later in its entirety on Facebook and YouTube as well. Let us now move our discussions to the 2018 election and election campaign, I guess. Now, the results of the 2018 elections, winning by just 50.02%. Was the result too close for comfort for Vorengi Marama and Ayaz Sayed Kayum? Well, clearly. Um, but I, but I, must, I must say this, yeah. By the time of the 2018 election, I'd gone. I'd, I'd left the Corvus account in Suva, yeah. Okay. Um, so I wasn't there for that. I mean, I was I was present from time to time because I, of my climate work and was flying to Suva to do climate-related stuff and was aware of certain things going on behind the scenes. But I wasn't involved at all in the 2018 uh, campaign in terms of speech writing or anything. Yeah? Um, it didn't work, yeah. Um, I've written about this. Uh, I mean, I just find it astonishing that the AG knew that their vote was disintegrating because the Fiji Sun uh, was telling them that the polling was bad. Um, and instead of actually getting that polling and publicizing it as wide as possible to to get people behind the the Bainimarama government, you know, he, he ordered it to be suppressed. Now, in politics, you know, the conventional wisdom is that if 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 you're doing badly in this in the polls, you 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 fess up to that fact because you motivate your supporters to get out there to actually sort of like bolster your support, you know, to vote for you. Um, if you remember, but I was in Fiji um, in a private capacity at the time of the election, staying with a friend of mine. And if you remember election day in Fiji in 2018, it was absolutely pouring with, with rain, yeah, torrential rain. And a lot of people looked out the window and and said to themselves, you know, Frank's going to get it. So why would I kind of go out in this weather? Um, mm -hmm. If they'd have been told that sort of it was a close run thing and that and that Barney Marama, sorry, that Rambuka was gaining on him, um, they might have got out in bigger numbers to actually support Barney Marama. But he just scraped in. And but also a lot of that was also to do with the way in which the government and the and, and the state had treated Rambuka. Yeah. I mean, you, you once again. I mean, I call him Dobby the House Elf as as if it's as if he's a figure of fun, but unfortunately, the supervisor of elections, Mohammed Sanem, isn't funny at all. Yeah, I mean, he 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 acting at the behest of the AG goes on these sort of wild crusades, and part of that was to exclude, as you know, exclude um, Sidibeni Rambuka from the 2018 election. He failed. He failed again in the courts. And then, you know, within days of the election, the Chief Justice at the time, Anthony Gates, ruled that Rambuka could, could contest the election. There'd been a wave of sympathy for him because of his travails in the courts at the instigation of Sanim and the AG. Um, so, you know, he came very, very close to upsetting the apple cart. And, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's not worth really sort of raking over the, the mm. might have beens. But what would have happened in 2018 if they hadn't got back in? What would the military's response have been then to Rambuka? Yeah, I mean, I think I think one of the things that's extremely important, and I mean, I, I should have really said this right from the from the start, is is that you know the the, the partnership between Rambuka and Biman Prasad, the partnership between the alliance and and the National Federation Party, make it much less likely that there will be an intervention to prevent Rambuka from taking power which was what Baini Marama and a significant number of his supporters in the military would otherwise be inclined to do. I don't think it's going to happen. And one of the reasons for that too is that the closer links between the RFMF and the Australian uh, Defence Force and the New Zealand Defence Force, the, the Americans, the British, uh, these are all very encouraging things, which, which I hope will persuade the leadership of the RFMF, which I who I repeat, I have great respect for, will encourage them to do the, you know, the right thing and allow a free and fair election and for the P Fijian people to have, you know, their say. All right. Now, do you know the role that the Pakistani agency 
National Database and Registration Authority, NADRA, played in the elections in 2018. For example, who engaged them, what was their job description, how long before the elections they arrived, etc. Any- I know nothing about them. Nothing about them. Nothing at all. I suspect that because I don't know anything about them, that they came after I left uh, Corvus and left left the AG's office. You know, I don't okay. know anything about them. And in fact, in fact, I'm so, I'm stunned. What did, what was their role in Fiji? Do we know? Well, from uh, memory, from memory, uh, this was an outfit that was brought into Fiji to uh, set up the electronic voting system, so to say. No, I don't know that. All right, we'll move on. Now, the 2013 Constitution, Mm. did you have any specific role to play in the writing of the Constitution or the passage of the 2013 Constitution? No, none at all. Um, It it was formulated in the AG's office. And in, in fact, in one of the most striking possible ironies, the person who had the principal carriage of the Constitution on a daily basis in terms of drafting was Shavada Sharma, the Solicitor General, who, who who the AG has had, you know, dismissed, suspended and dismissed in mm-hmm. contravention of the Constitution. I mean, he was the guy who I observed, you know, at first hand taking the latest drafts into the AG. But it was a legal matter. It had nothing to do with us. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously, I wrote speeches supporting the notion and, and supporting the context you know the context of its of its introduction and supporting various elements of the constitution but i had nothing to do with the implementation or, or formulation or, or implementation of it it was all done by uh, the, the lawyers in the government okay let me now explore with you the parting of ways between you and uh, i guess uh, vicariously the fiji first government i mean obviously you were contracted to corvus Now, in February 2021, you posted an article that said, and I quote, why this article is so hard and sad for me to write isn't just the spectacle of the once-admired Frank Bainimarama as the AG's puppet and, increasingly, a figure of derision. It is what has gone before in my own relationship with the PM, because the record shows that I have publicly sided with Bainimarama since his coup of 2006, continually played advocate for him, went to work as an advisor to his government in 2012, and played a role in all the major events leading to the restoration of the parliamentary rule in 2014, including the tortured passage of the 2013 constitution. And I stayed with him well into his second term, writing hundreds of speeches and articles for him shepherding him through multiple challenges, including his relationship with the AG, and crafting Fiji's overall messaging in multiple global forums, including its presidency of the COP23 climate negotiations. I even wrote the state prayer. End of quote. Question that I need to address immediately is, Graham, were you sacked, pushed, or did you resign? I resigned. And in fact, I didn't resign to the Fijian government or the AG. I resigned from Corvus. Mm -hmm. And I went to a meeting with the prime minister to, you know, to have a parting meeting with him. He thanked me for for, for my work over the years. He said he couldn't have done it without me, wished me well and sort of said, you know, if you you feel like coming back, you know, after you've had a rest, come back. Um, When I went and saw the AG, um, he thanked me too for my work. He embraced me. Um, We said goodbye. but my, my, my estrangement for from the Fiji First Government is, came in two phases, yeah. I was extremely concerned uh, at the narrow win in 2018, the, the 50.02%, for this reason, that it was, most, uh, it was most likely to trigger another coup in Fiji if... The, if, if Fiji First, one, didn't win, or two, didn't win by a sufficient margin and that there was a threat to the Bainimarama government. Um, I sided with those in the military council who called for reforms of the government, including removing the AG as as attorney general and keeping him as minister for economy. And I published that military council document um, on on Grubsheet Fiji 
so it's all there to see. Um, I concurred with that document. I had meetings with the Prime Minister after I left Corvus at the uh, COP24 in Katowice in Poland. And I, I said to him, listen, you have to do something about reforming the government because this was a very near run thing. And he was horrified at how close it had been. I mean, he, he'd been told by the AG that they were, they were going to win. And in fact, they were both blaming each other for the result. I mean, the AG complained that the prime minister had been lazy and hadn't got out into the veneur like he said he was going to do and shore, to shore up the position. And of course, the prime minister was blaming the AG, you know, that, 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 and particularly upset with the AG because he hadn't told him what a close run thing that it was likely to be. So there was that, you know, and 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 of course, when it reached the the AG that I had had these meetings with the with the prime minister calling for reforms, I was I was you know a dead man walking in Fiji, uh, as far as he was concerned, because he saw that as an act of disloyalty. Um, but I continued as, and it's in my writing. I mean, anybody who wants to have a look at it, you know, grubsheet.com.au, you can you can see the whole history of the way in which this unfolded uh, over the last couple of years. Um, I, I finally broke with Bainimarama personally um, and his leadership uh, over uh, the, the, the assault on the institutions of state, you know, the, the, which, which, which brings me, about, which, you haven't asked me yet. <laughs> which, which I come to right now. Now, yeah. initially, may, if I may please ask, what was the trigger for your departure? You've just mentioned those institutions of state. I'm coming to that in just a wee moment because. Um, Initially, it was stated that you left because of uh, reasons of ailing health. Now, was this true in any way? No, no, no I wasn't. I, I wasn't sick. Yeah, I wasn't. Mm. I, I wasn't sick, but I was. You know, I felt burnt out. Yeah, I. It. You know, it was an extremely demanding job, and I mean, you know, it, in in my mid sixties, I was feeling it. Yeah. Um, so there was. You know, there was. I mean, I just had to. I had to get out of there to recharge my batteries, and I think. That this is quite a common thing, and particularly as you get older in life, you know. I mean, uh, I don't think that that's any any that. I mean, I I don't call that ailing or Ill, in ill health. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in fact, you know, when in the prime minister's famous kind of attack on me, he didn't mention ill health. He just sort of said, you know, um, what did he say that I was over? I'll come. I'll come to that because I will <laughs> quote him directly now. You've been... I'm extremely fit. You can see me. I walk five k's a day, and I swim uh, a k one k one point three k's a day, fifty laps of the of the local pool. All right, well done. Now, you've been very eager to talk about the assault on state institutions. Let me begin this phase here by saying that in 2018, you said back in 2018, I cannot support Frank Bani Marama and his government any longer. And the trigger is last week events in Parliament, the unbridled assault by the AG with the PM's blessing on Fiji's institutions of state. It's all over to you now, Graham. Please elaborate on this. Okay. If you're going to make fundamental changes to anything, I believe that you should have a mandate from the people to do that. In other words, you go to an election saying, we intend to do this. It's in our manifesto. If you vote for us, this is what we're going to do. Yeah? In successive occasions, the Bainimarama government, or the Baini, oh, sorry, the, the Kayum government with Bainimarama at its head has pushed through uh, uh, on Standing Order 51, which, which fast-tracks legislation, a whole lot of stuff for which it doesn't have a mandate. And the most glaring of those were the two things that he pushed through at the time that you're referring to, um, which, was the, which was the abolition of the assessor system, the abolition of the assessors, which was the closest thing that Fiji had to, to juries, yeah? The closest thing that we had to public participation in the criminal justice system. You know, with the barest... With actually, with with no consultation whatsoever with the with the legal profession, with no consultation, as far as I know, with the CJ and the Director of Public Prosecutions, the AG just announced the the abolition of something that had been going in Fiji for at that stage 125 years and had been the subject of official investig you know official inquiries which had, uh, you know, advocated its retention. I mean, in 1985, Sir David, sorry, in 1994, Sir David Beatty, 
uh, the former governor general of New Zealand in the Beatty report recommended that the assessors be retained. And the current director of public prosecutions, Christopher Pride, had in, 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 in at least one big speech said that the assessors should be retained because they were, you know, an important part of Fijian democracy. They, they, they sort of, you know, uh, they, they prevented the development of, of this notion of an elite passing judgment on people. You know, with a stroke of the pen, the AG, you know, gets rid of something that's been going, for, well, it's, it's 130 years ago it was, it was introduced, mm -hmm. but with no mandate, no consultation, no nothing, yeah? At the same time, if you if you recall, I mean, and the, that, that to me was stunning in itself, but at the same time, he did the same thing to set up the FICAC court, yeah? So the, the two branches of the FICAC court, the high court and the lower court, which are dedicated corruption courts, yeah? Again, that was set up with absolutely no consultation and with no mandate, which, by the way, introduced an extremely insidious element into the whole governance of the criminal justice system in Fiji. And that is that the supervisor of election, Mohamed Sanim, can refer candidates in the election to FICAC for investigation for whatever he, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, grievance he has about them not complying with the electoral laws, they investigate those politicians, and then that goes to the FICAC court, bypassing the DPP and the normal processes in which uh, in which these things happen. And unfortunately, the evidence is, and I'm very sorry to have to say this that there are clear indications that the FICAC court has received instructions that when people reach the FICAC courts, they're to be convicted. And that is a very, very serious assault on democracy, yeah? <laughs> because uh, it means that the, that the government has the, the, the power to exclude people from seeking uh, the, the approval of the of the public um, to stand as elected re as their elected representatives, and you can't you can't portray it as anything other than assault on democracy, and and that's the situation. I mean, we've we've had we've had some judges leave Fiji because, as I understand it, they have said that they'll only convict on the evidence. And, right. I mean, it's it's grave. It's a very grave situation that's developed. Yeah. And of course, on top of that, we have a situation in which there's been a naked assault on the rule of law in relation to the sacking of Shavad Sharma, the Solicitor General. Now, just sticking with um, just sticking with FICAC for a moment, uh, you have written about this, I believe, uh, the little known clause in the 2013 Constitution under Section 115, Clause 9, uh, the clause about, uh, this is the FICAC Act, Section 5. Um, would you like to just mention that? Uh, I think you're referring to the, the provision in the Constitution that the, that the head of FICAC uh, reports to the AG, right? That's right, is it is. Mean? Yeah, okay. So the, the Constitution lays down that um, that the head of FICAC should report uh, to, to the AG to advise the AG of whatever FICAC might be doing. This is, there is no requirement in the constitution for the same thing to happen with the DPP. The DPP is not obliged to go to the, the attorney general and tell him what he's doing or, you know, advise him what he's doing yeah, in the same way. And I think you understand this as a, as a, as a lawyer, as well as a journalist, Sashi, that uh, when you have a clause like that, it's also a reverse clause, as they call it in, in, in the law, in which it's axiomatic that if if the head of FICAC is in the AG's office advising him of things, that the AG also advises the head of FICAC uh, mm. what he'd like to, uh, him to do. I assume that's what you're referring to, right? Yes. I mean, I guess the important distinction here is that whereas the DPP's office only prosecutes after a formal police investigation has taken place and solely on the basis of public interest, and whether there is a reasonable chance of securing a conviction. Whereas here we have, I guess, by virtue of that constitutional clause, an obligation to report to the AG. Yeah. Correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 
the, the, the DPP doesn't have investigative powers like in the same way as FICAC does, yeah? I mean, the DPP, uh, Christopher Pride, gets a lot of flack, as you know, um, from certain parties for, 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 for not doing something, yeah? The DPP can only act on the, on the docket or the brief that he gets from the police. And so the police investigate, they bring it to him. He can, in certain instances, say to them, look, you know, I want you to go and investigate something else. But at the end of the day, he makes his decision based on, on what the police provide him with. He doesn't have an investigative arm himself. FICAC does have an investigative arm. They have a provision in the Constitution that, 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 that places the head of FICAC in the AG's office. Yeah? And then they have the ability to refer whatever case has come to them directly to their own courts. Yeah, I think this is an astonishing uh, uh, situation and and a grave threat to to a democracy again. Yeah, because because you know I think it's become pretty pretty evident that um, that this is you know has the propensity to be used if it's not already being used as a sort of you know for FICAC as a sort of ton ton macoot. You know the old the old sort of thugs of the Haitian dictator Papadoc yes. Duvalier to to, to deal with the government's opponents. Um, and and it's, it's, it's like everything, you know, the Caesar's wife principle. It, it's the appearance that that is happening that is just as bad as the actuality of that happening. Uh, and again, I, I'd say this, is, this was just a prelude to, 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 to a naked assault on the rule of law, um, you know, that, that I know you're going to ask me about. Graham, have a drink of water. Uh, you need that little break. <laughs> You're watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point, and our chief guest is Mr. Graham Davis as we uh, discuss things uh, about Fijian politics and his association with Corvus and the work he did uh, on behalf of Corvus for the Fijian government. Now, Graham, you were part, if I may use the words, uh, I guess, inner circle in the sense that you were close to the prime minister working from the AG's office. Was there any consultative process within the Fiji First Party? I mean, do ministers, for instance, have a say in matters? Do they talk about things? Do ministers express themselves in policy implementation or policy formation, budgetary allocations? Any consultation process at all, or is it uh, just a one-man show? I'm glad you said one man show because you know there's, there's constantly this notion that sort of it's a two man government, Barney Marama and Kayum. I think what you just said is more accurate reflection. And and if I could say that this is borne out very much in the best example that we have of the lack of cabinet governance in Fiji, yeah, and that is the removal of Mary Buniwanga, as she uh, was then and is now Mary Rakuita, um, uh, you know, having having um, parted from her husband, um, who opposed the notorious Bill 17, which was the bill mm. to alter, you know, the Itauke, the laws relating to e the management of Itauke land. We know that um, that Mary uh, Rakuita in the cabinet opposed Bill 17, which was extremely contentious and once again hadn't been the subject of consultation let alone a mandate, yeah? She opposed it on the basis that there'd been a lack of consultation. And as I understand it, she put forward an alternative proposal, um, which was considered but rejected. After that happened, the AG required her, instructed her that she had to make a speech in the parliament to defend his introduction of Bill 17 and the changes to Itauke management laws. She refused to do uh, to do so on the grounds of conscience and the fact that sort of, you know, she'd opposed it and she couldn't in all conscience advocate for something she didn't believe in. And on that basis, the AG went to the Prime Minister, told told him what had happened, and the Prime Minister called her in and demanded her resignation. So this was a cabinet minister, um, you know, who, 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 who once again is an outstanding individual. You know, I, I think anybody who reads my stuff knows that I have the highest opinion of Mary Rakuita, and in fact, I see her as a future leader. Um, if, if if she'll only sort of you know turn her attention to politics, she's got this new job as as you know with the Pacific Community, mm -hmm. but she's outstanding. Um, 
but but you know there's never really been a cabinet cabinet government in the in in the true sense of the word as it applies in in any, anywhere else in australia new zealand you know the orders come from the ag um the pm endorses it the the cabinet complies yeah and if you don't comply you you're shown the door i mean that that's just not good enough yeah i mean that 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 to me reeks of a two man one man dictatorship whichever way you want to put it i mean with the with the prime minister as the enabler of the ag and i don't think that's that's good for the governance of fiji either now the scenario that you've just given about ms uh, mary raquita you know this for a fact yeah okay now I to, um, I, can i just make this clear sure. i don't report anything that i know to be false i might float things that i suspect to be true Hmm. but in, in 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 what i've just enunciated to you i understand that to be fact okay now the prime minister's response uh, about you the prime minister if i may use these words hit out at you and made a personal attack the pm said and i quote pm said that you traded in gossip the stress was too much for you you always seem to find drama and if you couldn't find it you'd make it what is your response to an attack like that from the prime minister well you know as a british politician once said and i quoted it recently it was like being savaged by a dead sheep in terms of the accusations against me i mean it's not that i'm hanging out with sort of you know chinese whores at signals or sort of you know can't be you know got got lifted for shoplifting at mhs you know <laughs> um you know i mean i i you know i mean he's entitled to his opinion i mean i've i've said very nasty things about him and he's obviously upset with me um and he would say these things wouldn't he under the circumstances but but to tell you the truth i mean i was absolutely delighted i just couldn't believe my luck um that the prime minister attacked me in those terms because you know you can't buy that kind of publicity if you're trying to get readers to to websites and blogs yeah i mean uh, i was i was wishing that he'd he'd attack me every week so that i ended up on the front page of the fiji <laughs> times and the fiji sun and the lead item in all of the television news bulletins and the radio bulletins i mean this was christmas for me the, the following day my readership went up 30000 yeah which is bigger than a, than a lot of fijian towns so we're not going to level prime minister you know i mean no hard feelings i mean i any time you want to go for me be my guest <laughs> Now even after the attack um you said that you had a great deal of respect and affection for the prime minister please explain because i do i mean i mm -hmm. i genuinely liked the guy when i you know when i was close to him yeah i mean he's he's grumpy frank you know grumpy grandpa you know grandpa sleepy grandpa grumpy but he's you know he's a you know he's he's a he's a, he has an attractive personality you know i mean he's he you know he's got a great affinity for for kids and you know he loves his family and there's a lot you know and you see you we've seen we've all seen him in action in the vanua he has the ability to connect with people yes. i mean i always admired that you know uh, i mean i i i said it to him too and i you know i was a big advocate for this behind the scenes in government you know throw away the bloody corva speech you know speak from the heart frank when you go into the village yeah um you know show more of the genuine you because you know it, he's capable of doing it and funnily enough you know away from the formal speeches which which, which you know he seemed to rely on so much at the talanoa sessions wherever he went you know in remote areas banua levu wherever which followed the official events you could see bani marama at his most authentic and people responded to that i mean i think that's why he still has um the political capital that he that he has in sections of the vanua because you know what you see is what you get the guys sitting there on the mat you know in front of the young golden ball he's making jokes and all that kind of stuff so you know you, you of course people are warm to that kind of thing it's an it's a normal human thing um i'm just disappointed in him because he could have been great you know he could have been a great leader and he started out great and he's kind of going to end you know not so great and in fact you know if if he's defeated i feel very sorry for him because you know he'll be humiliated and his place in history won't be, won't be as great as it otherwise might have been why are you now advocating for the fiji first party's defeat because i can't think i can't honestly think that i can't honestly 
continue to advocate for a government that treats democracy with such disdain. You know, I only supported these guys to make Fiji better, yeah, not to make Fiji worse and take us down the Zimbabwe road. And the things that I've mentioned, you know, the assault on the institutions of state is exactly what happened under Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe. Right? They didn't have a mandate for it. Uh, decent thinking people should not support this, yeah, because because it is an assault on democracy. It's an assault on our way of life, and I I couldn't in all conscience continue to support that. And we still haven't got to the one I really want to talk about, which is yes. the breach of the constitution. <laughs> yes, I'm saving the best for the last. Oh, thank now, you. you you said uh, that you had a lot to get off your chest, that there was a lack of empathy of uh, fat cat MPs, especially those on the Fiji First government benches. There was a nation in deep distress. What did you mean by this? I Look, the separation between the way in which these guys conduct themselves and the reality on the ground. I mean... I watched your show with Sashi Kieran, you know, and I, it was just, it was so sad to, 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 to see that, yeah? I mean, we have, what, 30% of the population living in abject poverty? Yes. And these guys are sort of riding around in their Prados, you know, multiple cars, you know, with retinues of this, that, and everything else, um, you know, being prescriptive, telling people how to live their lives. I mean, the, it's not a day goes by that the AG doesn't tell, tell somebody, whether it's the you know, the bus owners or, you know, university people or whatever, how they should conduct themselves. It's, it's just, you know, it's just unseemly. It's, it's, it's not, uh, you know, what I signed up for with them years ago. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think it's, it's, it's terrible. I mean, I've always had this thing that the most important thing that, that Fiji and any Fijian government should do is to support the underprivileged, yeah? It's about people, the have-nots, yeah? They should be at the forefront of everything any government does, yeah? But, but you know, the, the collapse of the health system, the collapse of the education system, these are things that, were, that should be devices to lift people up that have been allowed to sort of deteriorate. And it's having a terrible impact uh, on, on people's lives, you know, the, the, the cost of living challenges people face. And, you know, I, 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 I've always been struck, and I think I mentioned this to, towards the top, you know, the, the people who give most in Fiji, the people who have the least, yeah. I'll never forget, um, you know, in the 1960s, uh, coming down uh, the hill during very severe flooding from Nandarivatu down onto the Tavua Plain, and we were stuck at a bridge, yeah, which, you, which we couldn't cross. And I was with my mother, just the two of us, yeah. Um, I don't know where my father was. And we couldn't get across this river, and we're thinking, oh, my God, what are we going to do? So we stayed in the car. Suddenly, this Indian family appeared um, and said, look, please come with us. You know, you come to our place. And it was a, it was a sort of, you know, a wrought iron shack, you know, uh, you know, surrounded by a very small cane plot. And we stayed there, you know, overnight. They gave us, you know, the food that they had, you know. And I've never forgotten that. Never. All right. Now, you have previously mentioned that the Fiji First and the PM have lost the plot. How, when, and in which way? <laughs> Where do I begin? Um, you know, I, I, I don't think... As, perhaps I think as a lot of recently. Of, sorry, mm, <laughs> perhaps uh, as of recently, rather than, I don't know. It's up to you. Where, where, where did it all start? I don't know where it all started, except that that, that essentially, you know, para, power. As I said, I, you know, as I said before, power, power corrupts, and power corrupts absolutely. Power corrupts absolutely. I mean, it's a it's a truism in 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 politics the world over. I mean, since Roman times, you know. Is, in fact, I think that the phrase has its has its origins in in ancient Rome. Um, yeah, you know it, the. They've become more authoritarian. They've become more prescriptive. They've become less consultative. They've become more intolerant. They've become more intolerant of contrary opinion, let alone actual dissent. I mean, the spectacle of opposition figures being taken from their homes by the, by the police and detained for 48 hours without charge, which they can do under the law, 
which we've seen repeatedly, yeah, is just a disgrace. You know, the, the, these these guys have lost the plot, all right, because because these people are standing up for a constituent, con, you know, for constituents. There are there in the case of elected MPs, that people have put them there to represent their interests. That's how that's how they got into parliament, and the use of the state, uh, you know, uh, you know, resources like the police. And and this this new and very frightening new uh, uh, arm of the police, the commissioner's task force, you know, which which is un you know uh, police officers out of uniform with the assistance of the military, you know, with a with a nationwide brief to quell dissent and 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 come down hard on people. This is very frightening for for democracy. And the and the thing is that as time has gone by, they don't even pretend. Uh, uh, to cover it up, yeah. I mean, we saw we saw a, a, you know a whole lot of politicians, uh, you know, taken in and questioned for a couple of days. I mean, there's never any suggestion that they're going to be charged with anything because they haven't really done anything wrong. And certainly, you know, um, nobody wants to spend 48 hours in police custody. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's still not a pleasant experience. But this is what they can do under the law before they have to lay charges, and and that is being misused and and blatantly so. Um, so there's that. I mean, I'm sure there's lots of other, um, you know, examples. But that I think that's the most glaring. And of course, what happened at, at the USP is another thing altogether. I mean, just coming to, to that. Very oh, okay, right. Just ahead. coming now. Before the USP, um, in relation to the FNPF. You said it was one of the most cynical exercises in spin in relation to the government policy of assisting Fijians to draw on their retirement savings. What did you mean by this? Well, I mean, it's a bit like me coming to you and saying, you know, um, Sashi, uh, I've just taken this uh, $10 note out of your pocket here. You, um, I'm helping you <laughs> mm. by giving you this. I mean, the, the notion of, of telling Fijians that having access to their retirement savings to get through a crisis is assistance, is, is like Orwellian. Yeah? It's just bizarre. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, it, it's it, oh, you can, you, can, you can get your own money out to help yourself, but, but we're going to say uh, we're helping you. I mean, this is just an outrage. I mean, I would never, if I'd have been doing the spin for the Fiji First Government, uh, countenance that I would have that would have been a resignation issue for me I'm sorry now, that's just that's just yep. that is perverse in the extreme yes well the definition of assistance I guess uh, to different people means different things now still on the FNPF Graham is the FNPF a crisis in the making or is it already in crisis what what is ahead I don't know, uh, to be honest. You know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I don't keep an eye on the day-to-day -day financial um, thing of the FNPF. As I understand it, it's, it's still in in a healthy condition, and and you know, it has it has a huge amount of financial strength. So I don't want to, I don't want to, you, you, you know, sort of damage confidence in the FNPF or the governance of the FNPF just on hearsay or sort of supposition. But I don't think there's any doubt that the that the that the Fiji First government uses the FNPF as some sort of piggy bank, you know. Hmm. I mean, the the AG, you know, obliged the FNPF to take a portion of EFL, um, you know, when it had a budget shortfall, and to his credit, you know, the then uh, head, you know, chair of the FNPF refused to give the AG everything that he wanted. He gave him half of what he wanted. So he still had a budget shortfall. This thing of using the FNPF as a piggy bank to, 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 to get access to funds, to pay for the government's, you know, recurring expenditure is just outrageous. I mean, I, I personally don't think that the retirement savings of Fiji, of Fijians should be put at risk like that. But, but this is par for the course. I mean, you know, the FNPF is always there to do something. I mean, I saw, and in fact, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's reportable fact, demonstrable fact, you know, this, this, this bizarre plan for Fiji to build the United Nations agencies in, in Fiji, a dedicated headquarters. Um, at the time, the AG mentioned this, and I, and I published the, you know, the extract from the government Facebook page. He said that the FNPF would do that, you know. I mean, is the FNPF to be 
to be sort of the piggy bank that they go to for every harebrained idea. I mean, I, I personally find it offensive that the United Nations gets a building in Fiji in the same way as I found it offensive that they'd build new, a new headquarters for the prime minister in the middle of a, of a shocking crisis in which, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars is being borrowed and we're dependent on the largest of our, largest, largest, largest of our bigger neighbours. Um, you know, and 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 when the principal, the country's principal revenue is remittances. In other words, Fijians living overseas sending money to their relatives and friends so they can survive. I mean, this is just not appropriate. Let's move to, I guess, one of your favorite subjects: media freedom. Um, as a journalist, uh, this would be right up your alley. Uh, in Fiji, there have been speculations that the Attorney General has direct control with certain media outlets in Fiji and that the media organization uh, in particular uh, has lost all integrity. Now, in all your time working closely with the PM and the AG, did you come across any such direct control or interference with a media outlet? Were directives given to the media organization? Yes. Okay, would you like to elaborate on yeah, that? Or I will. Um, my view of the media in Fiji is that that it should be encouraged to separate news from opinion. Yeah, I was asked by the Fiji Sun to go to a Chatham House Rules encounter at the Holiday Inn in 2013 um, to talk about you know how the Fiji Sun should operate. You know, using my I, mean, I, I was billed as sort of you know the the award winning as you know, journalist kind of like coming and and doing this. And I made the point there that that the Fiji Sun should separate, you know, opinion from the news column so that when people read the news in the Fiji Sun, they recognised that as being a legitimate uh, account of what they knew to be true, you know. Um, and I said, and, and, it, and it was self-serving in the government's uh, interest, really, I said, because if you lose your credibility, if people know longer what they believe in the Fiji Sun, it's, it doesn't help the Fiji First Government at all, yeah? Uh, it, you lose by throwing away your independence uh, and, and in relation to the coverage of news, the credibility that the government needs to, to stay in power. And I think that's precisely what's happened, you know, that that, that that was ignored. And I remember telling the AG that I'd done this and he, he didn't, he wasn't happy at all. I mean, the AG has had a person at the Fiji Sun for a long time during my time and certainly since in the form of Jyoti Pratiba, uh, its news editor, who is his liaison at the paper. He tells her what to put in the paper. He tells her what not not what not to put in the paper, and the same uh, uh, you know instructions apply to the person I call you know the the white-haired sycophant of Rewa, Nemanin Delatiki, who who writes for the Fiji Sun from Hamilton, New Zealand. Um, you know the AG tells them what to report. The AG tells them what not to report. And the AG gives public money to the Fiji Sun in the form of an exclusive advertising uh, contract to the exclusion of the Fiji Times, a, 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 an, an advertising contract which is very exclusive. And in exchange for that, the Fiji Sun gives the AG has, you know, control of its editorial columns. Now, now, the fact is that this is a secret arrangement which the, which, the, which the Fijian people don't know about, and particularly the Fiji Sun readers, when they come to read that newspaper. And I regard that as corruption. I regard that as uh, highly improper behaviour, which is designed to manipulate public opinion without people knowing what that arrangement is. Yeah. Now, I'm prepared to give evidence at a an inquiry, which I hope will be set up after the election, to give, uh, uh, you know, chapter and verse of what I know about what goes on at the Fiji Sun and to a lesser extent at FBC, because I think it's vitally important that this is, that, 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 that time is called on this practice, yeah? The CJ Patel group have allowed the Fiji Sun to be commandeered by the government in a secret arrangement between them and the AG, which is not in the public interest and needs to be exposed. And this wow. inquiry, if necessary, should 
should divest the Fiji Sun, uh, oh, sorry, divest uh, CJ Patel of the Fiji Sun in the same way as the AG engineered uh, the, 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 you know, the Murdochs, prized the Murdochs out of, uh, uh, Rupert Murdoch out of the Fiji Times yes. with legislation if necessary, because it's not in the public interest. Similarly, um, you know, I think those uh, media outlets that don't do their job, that that know that something is true but don't report it because they're they're fearful, they also need to be brought to account, yeah, to some extent, to a lesser extent, obviously, because because we have this climate of fear in Fiji and this manipulation of the uh, of the Fiji Sun and FBC by the ruling party, that is to the de detriment of the interests of the Fijian people, and I and I I, I very strongly believe that. I mean, we. This is the Zimbabwe road, make no mistake about it, yeah? And we're starting to get to the worst parts of, the, of, of Zimbabwe, which is that the rule of law no longer applies or it applies selectively. Wow. Wow, I'm just absolutely astonished. Uh, I mean, if this was Australia or New Zealand for that matter, a commission of inquiry would have already been established to um, deal and to inquire about... Uh, media and its uh, oh, integrity. Now, let's look at media ethics while we're at it. In the February published Fiji Sun Western Force Union poll, opinion polls, rather, you uncovered irregularities. Grub Sheet actually blew the whistle on the entire polls. The poll results were skewed, you said. What are your views, firstly, on a media organization fixing numbers? Well, it's a disgrace. I mean, uh, it 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 was it's a, it, it was astonishing, and of course, you know, that was leaked to me by somebody who found it equally reprehensible. Um, you know, it's it, it, the Fiji. I mean, until, until and if the Fiji Times resuscitates the Tebbit poll, the Fiji Sun Western Force poll is the only thing that we've had in terms of you know establishing voter intentions. It's 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 through the Western Force poll that we that we know that 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 Sitaveni Rambuka enjoys the ascendancy that he has. We we look at it to sort of you know gauge the responses of uh, sorry the performance of the relative parties. And however much people sort of like pour scorn on on, on the Western Force poll because it's in the Fiji Sun, it's as good as we've got. Yeah, and it's been very very valuable. Um, this person shared my concern that this had been. Uh, this, this had been tampered with, and and so I uh, I got this. There's been a witch hunt since. There, you know, as I understand it, that announcement at the beginning of last week, last Monday, that the poll was being suspended, was because there was a an investigation going on at the Fiji Sun and in Western Force to try to establish the source of the leak. They didn't they didn't publicly deny the truth of the fact that they'd that they'd manipulated or doctored, uh, you know, the, the, the poll, they were more concerned about finding out who had actually sort of blown the whistle and, and given it to, you know, to, to, to me. Um, and then suddenly, miraculously on, fr on Friday, we get a, we get a poll um, published, you know, in which there's no explanation for the change of heart, you know, because they, because they said last Monday it was being suspended until the writs for the election were issued, which, at, 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 you know, which meant that, at the earliest, it would have been May that we had uh, that poll resume, or and at the latest December, assuming they went for a January 2023 poll. Then suddenly, in the in the Fiji Sun on on Friday, we get this astonishing Western Force poll that 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 that, that has um, Bainimarama coming from half the support of of Rambuka to go ahead of him. I mean, an astonishing uh, leap. Which, as far as I know, is unprecedented in the democratic world in terms of a, you know a couple of weeks or, or a month, yeah, a month of polling that there'd be such a turnaround. Because what did the prime minister do? He came back from his you know his, his quadruple bypass in Melbourne. He went to the opening of Black Rock. He spent the weekend in hospital on a drip, you know, getting antibiotics for an infection. He did a couple of minor engagements. He did sort of you know a couple of of Naila Lakai radio programs. And and that was ba that was basically it. That was not enough to produce that kind of turnaround. Which so so I'm deeply suspicious of that poll. I don't believe it. Well, let me just share the numbers for our viewers. The new poll that Graham's referring to came out two two days ago, which shows the PM's popularity increasing from twenty one point eight percent in February to thirty six percent in March, 
a jump of 14.2 points, 14.2 points. And uh, Graham, you've just said that uh, you don't buy that. You don't buy those figures. No, I don't buy those. I don't buy those figures. Um, and I think, you know, I don't think anybody with, with half a brain buys those figures. Yeah. Um, and and let me let me say this. You have to ask why it took five days for them to produce that poll after having said that they weren't going to have it for a long time. And and let me venture a possibility. We know that there are still elements in the RFMF trying to persuade the Prime Minister, even at this late stage, to make reforms of the government, including reducing the power of the AG, as the best means to get, you know, to, to win the election and and prevent anything from happening that might deviate from, you know, from, 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 from an illegal uh, means of keeping keeping them in power. Now, uh, those reports, um, you know, I can't confirm in the sense that, I, you know, I don't have, uh, you know, the names of the people who are trying to persuade the Prime Minister to do that. But certainly you can be sure that it will have reached the ears and uh, of the AG. And all I can conclude under the circumstances is that the AG, having suppressed the Fiji Sun polling before the 2018 election, may well have, uh, if he has control of the Fiji Sun, encouraged them to put the Prime Minister ahead of Rumbuka for his own purposes. It's entirely possible because, because basically now I, I don't think, I think they're capable of anything, which is, which is a very sad thing for me to say, you know. It is indeed, uh, particularly um, when you speak in terms of a media organization uh, being complicit. So the question that I have is, uh, excuse me, many people have this perception that the AG is the de facto prime minister of Fiji and that uh, Frank Bonimarama is just a figurehead. Would this perception be correct? You've uh, dealt with both gentlemen. Yeah. Yeah, it is correct. The prime minister is the putative head of the government. Yeah, he's the prime minister. He's, he's treated as such, you know, people give him the deference of, uh, uh, as prime minister. But he long ago sort of went out to lunch, you know. I mean, the AG runs the government. The AG has all, uh, you know, sort of, you know, a crushing control over the civil service, the cabinet, every facet of of national life in that sense, yeah. Um, the, the Prime Minister literally turns up and reads reads what Corvus has written uh, with the approval of the AG for him, whether, you know, in a hard copy on his iPad. Well, we've seen it repeatedly, right? That's that's what he does. He's the, he's, the, he's the ventriloquist puppet. But the ventriloquist is the AG, and it's been like that for a long time. Um, you know, uh, I mean, you, you know, we have to we have to be kind, you know, as as well here. I mean, the prime minister is clearly ailing. Yeah, he's got multiple health problems. It's not just his heart. You know, as I understand it, he has kidney challenges as well. His, you know, his brother's predeceased. You know, uh, or, or sorry, put it this way, his brothers obviously predeceased him, but but some of his brothers have died at, at a younger age than him. Uh, he's worried about uh, about about that. He was particularly concerned about getting COVID in the early stages. So we saw him wearing double masks and things like that, and and so he was very worried about that. I mean, you, you know, the soft side of me, you know, in terms of, of 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 the prime minister is, you know, give it away, mate. Yeah. In fact, you know, at the beginning of last year, I sent him a personal letter saying. You know, it's time for you to give it away. Why don't you go to the presidency when, while the opportunity is here? Yeah, and um, and that's that's the best way for you to safeguard your place in history instead of facing an ignominious defeat. Now, why would I do that? It was it was because I pers still personally have, a, you know, a, a degree of personal fondness for the guy. But I I also I also will never forget Barney Marama having the courage to do what he did you know, to, to level the playing field. I mean, you can't, you can never take that away from him, which is why I think that even in defeat, he will still be a respected figure in Fiji. Um, 
you know, the opposition will give him the credit that he's due um, in a way that that I that I wonder whether they will do for Aya Said Kayum. I mean, I I I, th I think you know um, Bani Marama still has a degree of mana in the country, and nobody would really want to see him, uh, you know, humiliated. Um, I mean, at least that's my view. I could be wrong. Now, Aya Said Kayum, do you think he can become the Prime Minister of Fiji, and will the Military Council? ever accept that scenario your personal view opinion we know what the military council thought after the 2018 election and that was that it produced this document the contents of which i've published but i haven't published the actual or, or published the actual document because on legal reasons because i'd received it uh, arguably in in the conduct of my uh, official duties still as somebody working on the COP. Um, we know that in that document, they urge the Prime Minister to reform the government by removing Ayaside Kayum as AG and keeping him as Minister of the Economy. But, but that document also sort of has a whole lot of other things about you know, addressing the perception of cronyism and of Muslims being, you know, appointed to positions in a disproportionate numbers and what have you. On that basis alone, right, and I haven't had conversations with military uh, officers at any level since about whether or not the AG is acceptable, but it's fair to assume that on the basis of that document, they would hardly be falling over themselves to urge the Prime Minister to make Ayaz Syed Kayum his successor, and especially when at a meeting of the military council, when he was specifically asked in front of the whole lot of them who his successor was, he said Inia. two words, Inia Seri Ratu, yeah? Right. Now, whether or not that's the, still the case is a matter of conjecture because my understanding is that Baini Marama has told certain members of his family that his plan is to contest the next election and then hand over to the AG. Now, I again, I don't know that as an absolute fact, yeah, but the sources for that are, are, are pretty good. And if that is the case, if a vote for Barney Marama at the next election is actually a vote for Kai Um as prime minister in the next term of Fiji first, assuming they win, the Fijian people have an absolute right to know that, yeah. We need to be told if that is the plan, and I'm hoping that the Fiji media gets off its backside and kind of starts asking that in the election lead up. And it's not enough for them to say, oh, no comment, or we're not going to sort of do this, because it's absolutely critical that anyone who votes for Fiji first understands that. Do you think one can be without the other? Um, is this a symbiotic, a symbiotic relationship between the PM and the AG? Or can the AG just go on its own? Well, I mean, you know, the AG needs the Prime Minister as cover, yeah? I mean, he, he, the, the Prime Minister is the vote-getter, right? I mean, the Prime Minister is the guy who got the big votes. I mean, if you look at the at, at the AG's relative performance in 2014 as, as a, you know, sorry, in 2018 as opposed to 2014, he pretty much got the same number of votes, 14,000, 15,000, yeah? It's Baini Marama who's been the big vote-getter, yeah? 225 or whatever it is, yeah? I can't remember off the top of my head. But he's the, he's the man. He's the star, yeah. Mm. Uh, which is why the the AG will have done everything he possibly could to persuade the prime minister not to go before the election because he knows he will lose. Yeah, he does. He does not have the star quality under the Dont system that would ensure that he gets the level of votes needed to sweep into power and and carry all these kind of like, you know, wannabes and has-beens in, in, in Fiji first ranks across the line again. Um, I don't believe he, he can be prime minister, you know, without getting that springboard, uh, you know, from, from Barney Marama into the next term. We, we know he wants to be prime minister. Yeah, he, 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 he wants to be prime minister. He desperately wants to be prime minister. But he's carrying a hell of a lot of baggage. Yeah. I mean, irrespective of the fact that the DPP didn't prosecute him over the accusations that he was that he made and, and detonated bombs 
as part of the Indo-Fijian resistance movement in 1987. That has not been put to rest. Yeah, there are people around who know the details of that, and that will haunt the AG all the way through the next election and to any any uh, scenario in which he would lead. So put it this way, I wouldn't put money on it. Okay, have a drink of water. Um, I've had you talking for quite a bit. We're heading towards the home stretch, but I still have a number of questions left. Um, let us look at the USP saga. The government has been holding back some 60-odd million dollars in funds. This is like holding the USP to ransom, and the decision affects the whole region. Do you think the powers that be understands how regionalism works in the context of the USP? No. Ever since the USP was formed more than 50 years ago, 1965 or whenever it was, um, regionalism, the principle of regionalism, the principle of uh, reflecting the wishes, desires, aspirations of other Pacific nations has been at the root of the entire, you know, USP ethos, if you like. Um, I... I used to be concerned when, even when I was in, 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 you know, assisting the government, that it was always about Fiji first, yeah, uh, not, not in a in the political party sense, but that they were, you know, particularly the the AG had this notion that Fiji was the first amongst equals, and what we want goes, yeah, with the other island nations. Um, and I think the best example of that is USP, yeah? We know that the other island members of the USP Council did not support the AG in removing Paul Alawalia. We know that uh, the reforms that the, that the AG want are driven by his own agenda, yeah? Not the good of the USP, necessarily. It's almost as if having not got he wanted at USP, that he's intending to punish everybody by withholding the money. But the thing is, it's not his money. It's not his uncle Mahmoud's money. Yeah? It's the, it, it's, it's the Fijian taxpayer's money. And I think the spectacle of Fiji withholding its contribution to USP is a, is a shocking example to the region of our priorities, which is, you know, our way or the highway, um, against their wishes. The deportation of Pal Alawalia was a shocking thing to have done to somebody who was the representative of a, of a regional organisation in Fiji. And, of course, they had the legal right to do it, but the moral right they did not have. Mm -hmm. And yeah. worse, the, you know, they don't care about the impact of this on USP students because programmes are going to be cut or have to be cut because they're withholding that money. I mean, we had a situation during the week where there's a water shortage at, 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 at USP because the whole, the whole of Suva's got, got problems in this area. USP can't afford to, 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 to buy extra tanks to, to insure itself against something like that because, because of the withdrawal of that funding. And the education of ordinary Fijian students is being affected by um, the AG's, you know, nighty rip you know, ripping up his nighty about about not getting his way at, 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 at USP. And I think it's just astonishing because, as I understand it, the US, the wider USP community, students, staff and families and, you know, mums and dads and all that kind of stuff, the voter numbers there are about 25,000 people. The AG was so concerned about the 27,000, to keep the 27,000 civil servants on side that he fell over backwards not to not to cut their salaries and sort of, you know, to protect their jobs. And yet, and yet he's thumbing his nose at sort of, you know, 25,000 people who are looking on, you know, with a scance at his, at his conduct in relation to USP. This is going to be a big election issue. If the AG doesn't relent and that money is not freed up, I would, in, in his position, be not looking to expecting any support, you know, from 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 the young people and he's and he and the youth vote as you know is prized because so many well the majority of voters are young people um 
and I just think it's a folly. I, th I think it's a, you, you know, this is a kind of, this is an astonishing thing. I, I, I really can't understand it. We have we now have a situation where Paolo Lawalia, having been thrown out of Fiji, is now running the university from Samoa. There's no sign of, of, of the university council relenting on this and giving the AG what he wants. Who's stuck in the middle? Who, who are the people caught in the middle of all of this? Young Fijian kids, yeah? It's just mm. unbelievable. Okay, now let me discuss the judiciary and the government influence, if any. In all your time working with the government, was there ever any evidence to suggest that the executive arm of the government influence the judiciary i've got to be very careful what i say about this as you know because um any comment that undermines public confidence in the judici judiciary is is can be construed as scandalizing the courts and mm -hmm. a bench warrant could be issued for my arrest for contempt and incidentally you too sashi you know as you know yes. as a lawyer um so you can't impugn the in, the independence of the judiciary uh and particularly the chief justice yeah well what i no can say to... is this what yes. i can say is this that there is clear evidence just in the facts themselves that the supreme law in fiji the constitution the the, the 2013 constitution has been breached in its relation to the provisions about what ought to happen with the removal or dismissal of the Solicitor General. Let's discuss that now. Yeah. You've raised that a number of times. And uh, so if you could set the scene here of Mr. Sharvada Sharma's uh, termination, so to say. Um, I know I've read that uh, portion of the constitution. There are set protocols uh, to follow in, uh, for want of a better word, for getting rid of uh, the Solicitor General. Please set the scene and uh, have your say. Okay, well, let me provide a bit of context. Yeah, I worked at close quarters with Shavada Sharma for several years. Yeah? I have never met a more dedicated, hardworking civil servant. Yeah, exemplary conduct, exemplary performance, exemplary application to his job. Yeah? And I mentioned before his role in the formation of the 2013 constitution and also loyal to the AG to a T. Yeah? The AG has had no reason whatsoever to doubt uh, Shavada Sharma's loyalty. As you know, and as the, as the, as the public knows, that the, the Solicitor General fell foul because of his alleged conduct in the prosecution brought by the elections office, Mohammed Sanim, against Nico Nawai Kula. Nico Nawai Kula, you know, uh, beat them in the courts and the Chief Justice made very unflattering comments about Mohammed Sanim uh, and, and in relation to the case. Now, immediately after that, um, Shavada Sharma was targeted, yeah? The, the astonishing thing about all of this is that it, it it didn't involve the AG dealing with this on his own, yeah, and 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 the proper institutions of state functioning as they should have in relation to allegations by Mohammed Sanim that he misbehaved, yeah. the The prime minister was given the job of of, of getting rid of Shavad Sharma. And Shavada Sharma is, is on the public record because, because John Apted outlined it all in the case that Shavada Sharma has brought for a judicial review of his sacking. Shavada Sharma was called to the Prime Minister's office and the Prime Minister asked for his resignation. He, he refused to resign. At some point, the, the Prime Minister um, instructed uh, uh, and I've got to be careful here. At some point, after the Prime Minister's intervention, the Solicitor General was sacked. And he was sacked by the head of the judicial... Sorry, he was sacked by His Excellency the President, and it was the last president, Georgie Conrotti, on the recommendation of the head of the Judicial Services Commission, who happens to be the Chief Justice, Kamal Kumar. We all need to be... a, a 
very mindful of the way in which Shavada Sharma was treated in the Prime Minister's office. When he refused to do what the Prime Minister wanted, the Prime Minister instructed his security guards to take Shavada Sharma's mobile phone off him in the anteroom of the Prime Minister's office. This was while the guy was still the Solicitor General of Fiji. He still held that position. He had not been removed. He had not been suspended, let alone dismissed. Shavada Sharma went across back to Suvavo House, where his office is, and as soon as he arrived there, they seized his computer, also while he was still Solicitor General of Fiji. Now, this is astonishing. Yeah, The guy was paraded through the office in front of everybody, treated in an astonishingly humiliating fashion. The question is, though, why weren't the normal protocols of the state observed? Yeah, Why was the prime minister involved at all? The prime minister has nothing to do with it. Yeah, he's the he's the executive head of government. I mean, I can only speculate that the AG didn't have the guts to do all of this himself, so he got Frank to do it, thinking that uh, Shavada Sharma would cave in and 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 accept that he needed to resign because of the authority of the PM in his office. But both of those guys made a terrible uh, underestimation of this guy's uh, of Shavada Sharma's determination. But let's just go to the substantive issue here of what the Constitution says. The Constitution stipulates in black and white here in this document how Shavada Shah, any Solicitor General actually, is sacked for, mis for misbehavior. And the head of the Judicial Services Commission has to convene a tribunal of judges to hear the allegations against him. It then has to make a ruling and give that to His Excellency the President. And that recommendation has to be made public. None of that happened. Yeah. Shavada Sharma was summarily dismissed. And of course, it's in the courts and and the, and some of that detail, of course, we can't uh, discuss because it's sub judice. But that is sure. what happened. This was yet an th I'm sorry, this in fact, this is much worse than uh, than than what I've already talked about in relation to um, you know, the change, you know, the abolition of the assessors and the, and, and the setting up of the FICAC court, because this is a fundamental assault on the rule of law. This is the supreme law of Fiji. All other laws flow from this document. And yet it was willfully abrogated. We still don't have any explanations to how that happened, but this is a matter of grave concern to every single Fijian. And we need to have an accounting for this. And hopefully this, uh, this will be dealt with in, in, in the current court proceedings. Beyond that, I think I'm already, and you, you may be too, Sasha, on shaky grounds. Uh, I think, Canada, yeah. Um, actual issues. But, but you know, it, it was a terrible, terrible injustice as far as I'm concerned in relation to Shavada Sharma himself, who, 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 uh, who, as I say, I witnessed him and his performance up close for a very long time. And he... He's one of those guys like Yogesh Karan, who the incoming government, you know, need to value because they understand fundamentally the independence, the independent role of a civil servant, which is to serve the government of the day. When so many other people are acolytes and toadies and sort of rely on the AG's patronage and serve him and have completely breached that principle, you know, which, 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 which is really uh, shocking in itself. All right, we will eagerly await the judgment that's going to come out of that uh, court case. Perhaps move our discussion, sir. Now, on social media, there have been attacks against you, uh, that uh, you have acted against the interests of the Eto K and the Muslim communities. What is your response to that? Well, look, you know, people can say what they like. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I want people to be able to express their opinions. And, I, and, it's, I, and to be frank with you, being attacked just comes with, you know, with with what I do, which is to sort of, you know, mm. shine a light in in places that people don't, don't you know, they don't want it to be shined. Um, you, you know, I, t I take this criticism seriously only when it when it's explicit threats to my welfare, and that has happened. I have had cause to go to the police uh, after having been followed home from the station one day. I don't want to go into the details of this, but I mean, any sure. anybody who wants to come for me needs to understand that I have enhanced security and that the authorities know 
that it, that 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 there have been uh, incidents which give rise to concern. Apart from that, you can say what you like about me. I'm, you know, I'm I, I'm a big boy. You know, I, I, sometimes I fight back, sometimes I don't. The only thing that I get really upset with is boxing at shadows, which is why I'm so, um, you know, well, I'm I'm genuinely, uh, you know, upset with you know with with these Vatus trolls who kind of you know who, who, faceless trolls. They're not real people. They're they're made up people, and 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 you know. I don't want them on my uh, on my uh, pages, and uh, if I find them, I you know I delete them, and you know. But it's really unfortunate, and I and I feel sad about this that it's come to this in Fiji that we have this kind of you know Trumpian grubby you know situation in which public money is going to people who who pay phantoms to sort of like you know attack people. I mean, if I mean my my attitude is if you're not prepared to put your name to whatever you say, you're a coward. Yeah. In your time working for Corvus associated with the Fiji government, was there ever any buying off likes from Facebook? I mean no. this has been raised in recent times. No. No. No, never saw it. Never, never okay. saw one instance in which Corvus manipulated. I don't know what happened after I left. I mean, I, I have to say that. I don't know what's happened after I left. But certainly when I was there, never, ever, ever. Yeah. And it's, okay. it wasn't just me. There was a whole lot of people. I mean, you know, for, for instance, you know, the then uh, permanent secretary for, 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 for information, you know, um, you know, Sharon Smith-Johns. There was never anything like that. Never anything okay. like that. All right, a viewer question, if I may, please. Uh, ben Kush wants to know, mm. why do you loathe Mahendra Pal Chaudhry so much? I guess loathe is a very strong term, I must say. Well, but, I don't uh, your, him. your response. I don't loathe him. I think I've already explained. You know, the only time I've met Mahendra Chaudhry was when I did a Channel 9 interview with him in his, you know, in his office. Um, and it was, you know, when he was opposition leader, I think it was. And, and, and you know this is this is post what happened in in, in the rebellion of two thousand and, and the suffering that he that it, well the, what he suffered at the hands of Spate and his goons, and I felt very sorry for the guy in the sense, and I felt I felt empathy for the man because you know I, I found it absolutely disgraceful that an elected prime minister of Fiji should be treated in such a humiliating and brutal fashion. Yeah, so I've never had it in for the guy personally. You know, I've got problems with Mahendra Chowdhury's character arising from the fact that, you know, a, you know, he hit a woman and and she died in his car in 1978. And, you know, the judge, the presiding judge at the time said he treated her no better than a dog. I've got a problem with that, right? I don't think that's a great sign of character. I also have a problem with him stashing, you know, money that he received from India in Australian bank accounts and not telling people. And of course, as you know, he received a sentence for that, which precluded has precluded him up until this point from contesting the election. So there's that, yeah? Mahendra Chowdhury is entitled, like any Fijian, to, to stand for office. I don't happen to think he's going to make the 5% uh, threshold, but if he does, you know he should be welcomed into the parliament and 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 as as a former prime minister he deserves you know a certain amount of um well he deserves he deserves the respect that any uh prime minister ex prime minister of fiji deserves and this is the interesting thing because because Barney marama's treatment and kayum's treatment of city of anirambuka has opened up the possibility of you know some very unpleasant reprisals i mean i was there the day that uh I, as Syed Kayum, ordered that that Rambuka's official car be stripped from him. And that action took place on a road in Vanuelevu in which Rambuka was left by the side of the road. They better watch it. Yeah? Hmm. That's not All a way right. to treat the former Prime Minister of Fiji. <laughs> now, you mentioned earlier that um, you made a comment to the Attorney General's father that the AG would have made a successful Prime Minister. Do you still have that view? No. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I've got a watch that speaks at me every now and again. It's, she said okay, so I must have said something. <laughs> so the answer <laughs> is no. The answer is no. No. 
I mean, at the time I did, and I look, I think he's a very clever guy, but he's but as I say, there's not a democratic bone in, in his body. It's my way or the highway. He's totally prescriptive. He doesn't take notice of the opinions of others. He doesn't care about other people's opinions. You know, I mean, okay. I'm sorry. I've I've seen I've seen that repeatedly. I don't think he's fit for for high office at all because I think people who are in leadership roles need to have a degree of humility. They need to have they need to be they need to understand that their, their ultimate bosses are the people who put them there. And I don't think he understands that at all. I mean, don't forget, well, part of the problem is that he and Bani Marama did whatever they pleased from 2006 to 2014. And so they got used to sort of you know, ordering everybody around. The problem is they didn't, you know, they, that attitude didn't change after 2014. They still expect everybody to do, to, to, to do as they say, uh, not as they do, incidentally. Yeah. And now it's gone to another level. I mean, they treat, they treat Fiji Airways as a private airline. I mean, the, 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 the prime minister came back from, from his heart operation in Melbourne in, in an Airbus A330 on a route that is normally flown by a 737 MAX. What happened in that instance? Because we know that the prime minister has an aversion to flying in small planes. And we all know about the bad publicity involving the 737 MAX. Why was a much bigger aircraft sent to pick him up? Why did the prime did the AG come back from Singapore giving a lift to a party donor who turned out to have been the person who you know brought the COVID-19 virus to Fiji? You know, hmm. this is this is this is not regular behavior. This is Mugabe okay. Zimbabwe style behavior. Today's Fiji. I think you've answered this, but I'd like to hear it again. Is it in reality a one-man show, a two-man show, or a government of inclusiveness and unity? Well, I think I've, I think I've already answered that, yeah. Sashi, by saying, you know, it's a two-man government in which one, one, one man makes the decisions and the other guy rubber stamps them, yeah? Okay. It's not always been that way. I mean, there's, there's, been, there's been fights between Barney Rama and Kayum. There was an almighty schism between them over the... The fact, you know, the notorious Insta Charge affair, where the AG had, uh, had told the Prime Minister that he shouldn't endorse a madcap scheme in which people will be able to charge their phones over the internet, you know, and it explained to him, and it had been explained to him, you know, in infinite detail that it was physically impossible in the laws of physics or whatever it is uh, to do. I mean, that was a huge schism, which I which I was involved with in the sense that I brokered a peace between the two. So it's not always been you know smooth sailing um but um but yeah um i mean in answer to your question uh, you know it it's 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 not a cabinet government it's not a healthy situation in which people can express contrary opinion and the whole thing about cabinet governments anywhere in the world is when the cabinet when the door to the cabinet room shuts anybody can say whatever they like yeah um and when and when and ministers have responsibility for you know for 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 you know, for their portfolios. The problem in Fiji is that everybody is second guessing what the AG may or may not think about something or other. So that, so that, you know, the process of government is in a state of arrested development in many instances. And that's not in the national interest at all. I'm hoping that whoever replaces these guys will return to cabinet government, will, you know, will reassert the independence of the civil service. So that so that we have smooth transitions, you know, from government to government with the same personnel who serve whoever comes in with using their experience and giving and giving advice to to, to people coming in and, and, and for those incoming governments to be able to trust those individuals. Um, you know, so that's it's it's absolutely critically important that these things are reestablished in Fiji, which is why it's critically important, I think, that we should have a change of government. And you know, I'm encouraged by Rambuka's humility. Yeah, he's he 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 is displaying humility, a, a humility which is noticeably absent from Bani Marama and Kayum. Yeah, and and I'm hoping that the combination of those of him and those around him, with this infusion of uh, of, of of influence from the NFP, you know produces a better outcome and i think it's very exciting because you know we already know that that at the moment you, you know we're going to have people like on the nfp side uh, you, you know they haven't announced their candidates but we know that it's going to be you know rumbuka it's we, we know linda tambui is going to be there 
you know, Vosaronga is going to be there. You know, Manoa Kamikamitha is going to be there. So, so that's 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 some of those individuals on that side. But now we know that it, it's Beerman Prasad, it's Pio Tikandundua, it's Lenore and Garingera Tambua, it's Richard Naidu. You know, even with that, we're starting to get the core of a functioning alternative government, yeah, an attractive functioning alternative government. And of course, there's a whole lot of other people who who who, who are going to be in the mix because there's all these other candidates. So I, I I think that this this notion that sort of you know we can't get rid of Fiji first because there's no alternative is rubbish. Yeah, I think we are going to get a, a, an alternative when the election comes, and I, my personal view is that it's that it's time for a change, if only to establish that what I've mentioned before, which is that we have the first smooth transfer of power in Fiji. Uh, you know, in the 52 years since independence, I mean, it's amazing that we haven't, yeah, that it's, that's either been a coup or in 97, 1997, so, sorry, we, we, in in 1977, you know, with with Mara and, and Sadiq Koya, we had that sort of, you know, that constitutional crisis, which, which even though the NFP had got more votes, ended in Mara being prime minister again. I think that was the smoothest. The rest of it is just, you know, until until 2014 and 2018, you know, it was a, was problematic. And of course, that doesn't apply because that was the same government. I'm talking about a transfer of power. Okay. Um, I know I've taken a lot of your time, but we just have a few more questions to go through, Graham. I hope you don't mind. No, not at all. All right. Now, uh, some of the reforms that the AG has brought uh, in in Parliament, do you think race relations have been damaged in any way due to his overzealous reforms? No. I okay. I hope not anyway. Look, I, you know, I mean, I really hope that this is one of the sort of lasting achievements of the Fiji First Government, that they did what was required to do to end, you know, to, to, to sort of, you know, chase away the racial bogey, yeah? And we talked about the integration of the schools and, you know, the racial, end, the ending of race-based schools uh, and all of that. I mean, I think there's a unity in the country at a fundamental level that is actually showing itself in the lack of racist comments on social media, the lack of of this kind of, like, oh, you know, the Itakea, you know, are hard done by. It, it, the underprivileged in Fiji are all hun hard done by, Yeah. It doesn't matter if you're Itake or Indo-Fijian or, you know, Calathumpian. If you're poor in Fiji, you're not getting the deal that you should be getting. And I think there's an appreciation of that and a solidarity that is emerging, uh, you know, across these lines, yeah? Um, you know, you know I, th I, th I think it's fantastic that we've been seeing at some of these rallies. I mean, it was uh, Rambuka's rally had Indo-Fijians there at the NFP uh, yesterday. It was a very multiracial crowd. And, and you know, I was particularly upset today when when Fiji Village had a picture of the NFP hierarchy there with with Rambuka that had you know that had um, you know women, different you know ethnic groups around him. And at FBC they chose a photograph that had Bim and Prasad and Rambuka surrounded by Itake men. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I take that to be a deliberate attempt to portray. Prasad as a puppet of the Itauke nationalists, yeah? It's despicable. Yes, that, that agenda has been propagated by some people. I've, I've observed that myself. Now, a question that has intrigued a lot of people. Mr. Kayum is the minister responsible for elections. He's also the secretary general of the Fiji First Party. And as minister, he gives directions to the supervisor of elections. Does this not suggest a conflict of interest? Of course, it's a conflict of interest. It's a complete scandal. <laughs> I mean, the, you know, everybody knows Dobby the house elf is kind of, you know, does his master's bidding. I'm sorry, I witnessed this in government, you know, close up. I mean, you know, my office was down the corridor from the AG's office. When Sanim came to see him, he'd hide in my office and say to me, you know, oh, is he in yet? Is he in yet? And when I was in the office with the, with the AG and he, he appeared at the door on other occasions, you know, I would be sitting down and he would come in at the AG's summons and stand there like a little schoolboy. You know, mm. I, I was shocked by that because at the very least, you know, given his thing, I should have been asked to leave the room and for him to sit down. 
So, you know, it's, there's not even the appearance of independence uh, in, in this sense. I mean, I, I noticed the other day, you know, the, the, the AG telling the parliament that the, the bus fare increase, you know, was down to, the, you know, an independent body, you know, the, the Fiji consumer, you know, FCCC and Joel Abraham. I mean, Joel Abraham is not independent in the least. He's another Mohammed Sanim, yeah? The, the, mm. these, are the, these are the AG's elves, yeah? And, of course, the bus owners are upset because they know it as well. Yeah? There's no independent process. You know, Joel Abraham does what the AG tells him to do. And I'm afraid that's the same, you know, right across government because, because otherwise you're not there. All right. As we head towards the finishing post, few quick fire questions, if I may, but take your time to answer. Do you think there'll be free and fair elections? I hope so. I hope so. Look, we we still haven't heard something that's absolutely critical, and that is the MOG, yeah, the the minister, you know, the the the, the 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 election monitors, yeah. We haven't had an announcement on that. It's absolutely critical that, as in two thousand and fourteen and two thousand and eighteen, that we have inter international monitors. And if that doesn't happen, and I'm surprised no one in the Fijian media has asked this question of, of, of Sanim because he's, he's, he's in the media every day. I mean, you, you'd expect that somebody would have said to him, oh, SOE, you know, are we going to have monitors? Yeah, but it doesn't happen. Um, if we don't have inter uh, international monitors, I think people should be very worried about whether or not, the, you know, the, about the integrity of the poll. Um, I'm hoping it's going to happen. I mean, I, there's rumours that, you know, the New Zealanders are going to provide um, Sanim with a deputy. I hope that happens too, because, you know, when there are people looking over people's shoulders, they tend to sort of like, you know, to to, to behave with propriety. Um, you know, so all I can say is let's hope so. Okay. Now, what's in store for Fiji if there's no change in government? Five more years of the same, yeah, more of the same. I mean, we, we know that the Prime Minister is ailing. We know that he's unlikely to complete the next term. Um, who's going to replace him? I mean, it's inconceivable that, that Ineer Seri Ratu becomes Prime Minister in the event that the, 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 the Prime Minister stands aside because, you know, Kai um has done everything possible since the, the Prime Minister made that announcement to the Military Council, um, you know, uh, uh, that, 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 that Seri Ratu would be his, his successor. Uh, the AG is, has, has been given more and more control by the Prime Minister over the, over the, over the levers of government. Okay. Mm. What do you think should happen now, given that there has been 15 years of the Fiji First government rule? Time for a change? <laughs> yeah. It's All time. Right. Yeah. The great, the great, the great uh, Australian election... Uh, campaign slogan from 1972 that brought Gough Whitlam to power after 23 years of conservative rule. Yes, it's time. And what do you think will be the game changer in the forthcoming election? In what sense, Sashi? What's going to be the determining factor for people to make that, uh, to make their minds up that it is indeed time for a change? Well, I think that this is the critical um, challenge you know, that Rambuka has, has always faced, you know, our people, I mean, we know from the opinion polls that, that he has, you know, this support, uh, but is the, is the, is the broad mass of the Fijian people and particularly the Indo-Fijians who undoubtedly suffered in 1987. I mean, the stories are horrendous. If you go into the history of what happened as a result of Rambuka's coups, the stories are horrendous. Yeah. Beatings, rape, seizure of property you know there are there are good reasons for many indo-fijians to be upset about what happened there uh, i mean so many of them voted there with their feet we lost the best yeah of people you know because they all went overseas if they could yeah yeah the question so they have in their mind has has the leopard changed his spots has the snake shed his skin yeah can we trust this guy and I think that the events of recent days in which he's been joined by these people, and, and I mean, look, the most striking thing I can possibly point to is the photograph in today's uh, media of Richard Naidu standing next to Sitiveni Rambuka, yeah? I mean, seriously, mm -hmm. who'd have thunk 
Yeah. This was the guy who the indigenous nationalists dug a lava pit for in front of the statue of Ratu Sukuna in front of the, you know, the, the, the current parliament house. Yeah. He was, he, as you know, he was the press secretary to, to Modi Bavandra. Yes. Richard Naidu has cause to be deeply resentful of Sitaveni Rambuka at a personal level. And yet he now happily stands by him, smiling broadly and prepared to go into government with him as in a coalition to take Fiji forward. I think it pretty much says it all, doesn't it? It does. It does. Now, Graham, recently you, uh, this is a question from left field, I guess. Recently, you put out a Facebook post on your Grubsheet page appealing for information about a person by the name of Radha Krishnan or Radha Chetty. Mm. You express concern about the whereabouts and welfare of Radha. What was the background of this to this concern? Um, look, I, I, I've got to be I careful because, because I don't want to put anybody in danger. Yeah, Please don't. There are people who were involved in the Indo-Fijian uh, resistance movement in 1987 in which arms were obtained that were destined for the T Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka and diverted to Fiji. And, you know, a, a, an organized resistance was, you know, was, was put together. Some of those people have been given immunity, um, as you know. Um, but there are still people around who were part of that resistance movement who who say that this the story hasn't yet been told in full yeah and it and it relates to the alleged activities of the attorney general um at the time yeah now now i aside kayum is not part of the immunity provisions because he was never caught yeah um the the, the story from from these people is that he was able to escape to Fiji and that's and 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 seek refuge in Australia and so he wasn't part of those people who were brought to justice and some of these people are upset about that um, and I don't look I don't know all of the details all I know is that um, I got news that Radha Krishna had disappeared and people were worried about him it was a false alarm he was fine he contacted okay. me yeah. Um, so that's as that's as far as I'm going to go, um, but but if I could just repeat what I said earlier on, the the bombing thing hasn't gone away. Yeah, the question that eventually will have to be asked, especially if Ayasaid Kayum puts himself up uh, to be prime minister, is did he or did he not make and detonate bombs that injured people? Yeah. Now. Uh, it's inconceivable that he can be prime minister without an accounting for that. And of course, there are people who regard him, you know, as a freedom fighter. You know, those who who think it was a good idea for him to, you know, to use bombs to advance the the cause of the anti Rumbuka forces. And there are others who regard him as a terrorist. Yeah, but but it's something that if he is to be prime minister, has to be confronted. And and of course, there's also the people around him, allegedly around him, who include some of the biggest names. Um, in Fiji, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, yeah, no, I've, got, I've got to be circumspect. I mean, I don't want some people who are temporarily disappeared from the scene to permanently disappear from the scene, if you know what I mean. I know certainly what do you mean. Now, where to for Graham Davis now? Retirement After this interview? Or... No, no, no. Uh, in, in Oblivion. Terms... <laughs> no, not not at all. Uh, oh, you mean, the, you mean generally another... speaking? Perhaps another well, look, thirty thousand, you know, another thirty thousand hits on your grub sheet. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, you know. Next year, I'll have been a journalist for fifty years. Yeah, mm -hmm. May, nineteen seventy-three. Yeah, um, and I still haven't decided what I'm going to do when I grow up. So who knows what the future holds? <laughs> and uh, thoughts of returning to Fiji? Uh, <laughs> not in the immediate future. Yeah, not because surprised. at the very least, I would expect to have hospitality uh, from the constabulary at the at, at, at the glorious Tatonga police station for at least 48 hours and perhaps a ban on leaving the country until whatever comes my way is dealt with. I have been warned not to return, put it that way. Okay. Now, Graham, have you got everything off your chest today? Uh, have a look. <laughs> no. uh, yes, I mean it's been an astonishing um, 
uh, experience, Sashi, and I really thank you for your professionalism because, you know, I mean, and I mean this, I'm not, you know, I'm not being in any way patronizing uh, the combination of your journalistic background and your legal experience um, has really put you a cut above everybody, including myself. Um, you know, you, you're, you're, you're doing a fantastic service. You've established um, your program as an in integral part of the Fijian media, uh, you know, and you're performing a fantastic service. I mean, I find the, the programs you know, require a lot of commitment in terms of listening, but 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 you are, you have the capacity to elicit elicit information that others don't have, and it's great that you're actually sort of you know making such an impact um, in Fiji itself because it's badly needed. Graham, thank you very much, uh, and uh, I certainly appreciate your kind words. What is your message to the people of Fiji this afternoon? Uh message to the people of Fiji uh, don't give up hope yeah that we can have an orderly transfer of power to another government and really set uh, Fiji on a path to true democracy yeah because if you lose hope altogether we don't have any future yeah people have got to fight for for these things they've got to stand up and be counted for these things yeah I mean if you want more of the same vote Bani Marama Kayum if you want to change well, vote for whoever you like, but you know, I, I would I would say that the that the the most you know um, credible alternative now, and particularly since they've announced that they're going to go into coalition together, is People's Alliance and NFP. Um, I would love to have seen you know Savanada and Arumbe join that because you know he's such a he's such a knowledgeable person, and I love his articles, and you know he writes so well. Um, he and and his mate, um, you know, Mick Beddoes have got a thing about getting into bed with coup makers. But you know, the thing about get, about Fiji is that it's very hard to 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 shut the door on coup makers when there's so many of them around, and, and particularly when they constitute the two biggest choices at an election this this far this long after a coup. You know what I mean? I I, I mean, if, if if people regret their actions in the past. I think they should, that should be accepted. I mean, I, my father told me, and I've never forgotten it, never underestimate the capacity of the Fijian people for forgiveness, yeah? I think we should forgive uh, Sitiveni Rambuka for the actions of 1987 because he's not the same guy, yeah? The swagger went out of him a long time ago. He realized that what he did was wrong. He's apologized for it. He's forged these alliances that even at the cost of defeat for him in the 1990s, and he's going to the country asking us to trust him again and bringing in a whole lot of people. And the, and the astonishing thing is that he's got public support for that. I'd be the first to say, look, he's a has-been, but, it, but, but, but it's, the evidence is there that he is in, continues to inspire people. And the best thing to do is to, is to, is to improve uh, the, the, the people that, that, that would be in a Rambuka cabinet by you know, by identifying those people and voting for them and supporting them. Folks, those viewers uh, don't just uh, go away. Shortly, I'll be announcing who my chief guest is for next week. But for now, Mr. Graham Davis, uh, thank you very, very much for being my chief guest in Sashi Singh's Talking Point today. I must congratulate you for your very uh, illustrious uh, journalism career. For a Fiji-born and bred person, you have risen to the very top of your chosen career. Graham, thank you so much for the open discussion on your role in Fiji as a communication specialist. I'm pleased to have been able to share some interesting facts with you on, on so many subjects this afternoon. Um, I've seen the numbers, people, our viewers who've uh, stayed with us right throughout, and this is a record number for the SSTV program as well. So thank you once again. A very big Vinaka Vakalevu to you. Wishing you a blessed Sunday, Graham. Yeah, Vinaka Sashi. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you and God bless. Uh, like I said, folks, don't go yet. And uh, I've yet to reveal our guest for next week. Now, uh, reminder, today we had a bit of, uh, um, uh, a bit of uh, timing change. Uh, New South Wales has gone back in terms of uh, daylight saving. And it only dawned on me last night, and I very quickly put out the notice for the time change. So Fiji and New Zealand, it went back to 2 p.m. But uh, the good news is next week, 
will start the SST program Sydney time at 11 a.m. on Sunday, which means it will be 1 p.m. in Fiji and New Zealand and 6 p.m. In, uh, on Saturday in Los Angeles and San Francisco. I thank all those viewers who have taken time to provide their positive feedback with regards to this program. There's a lot of messages as well. Um, I'm sure uh, Graham is going to go and have a look at it, and uh, where he can, he'll probably respond to some. And uh, remember, SSTP will be back uh, next week for episode 16. A big thank you to my regular contributor, Nikhil Singh, for his input in the program today. To my SSTP team, a big thank you one more time. Now, next week. Next week, our chief guest on Sashi Singh's Talking Point will be Mr. Filimoni Vosarongo, leading Fiji lawyer and a representative of the People's Alliance. I'm really looking forward to that uh, interview. Now, if you have any questions for Mr. Filimoni Vosarongo, you can privately send me a message on the SSTP page. Please like and follow the SSTP page so you can get instant notification of the posts. I wish you all a very safe and uh, blessed week. In closing, I'll leave you with this quote from Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry said, The liberties of a people never were, never ever will be, secure when the transactions of their rulers may be concealed from them. The liberties of a people never were, nor ever will be, secure when the transactions of their rulers may be concealed from them. That's a quote in closing from Patrick Henry. Well, that's it for episode 15 of Sashi Singh's Talking Point on this Sunday afternoon. I am Sashi Singh, bidding you all goodbye, namaste, and ni samode. Goodbye, world.